Welcome to the latest episode of The Claws Corner. Today's guest is an actor, writer, producer, director, and founder of Hawk Studios. His latest movie is entitled Article 92. So please welcome back the extremely talented and also frequent guest and friend of The Claws Corner, Joe McGee. Joe, how the hell are you? So glad to have you back. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be back. Uh, we did this uh, a while. It's been a while, but we're back. We had some um, some issues. You know, we had, um, you know, you were sick. And then I had uh, some issues as well. Um, a good friend of mine who was an executive producer in one of my films, not just my recent film, but all my films. Mario Canero just lost his life recently. So it's very tragic, very sad for everyone. And uh, we finally got together now, though. So that's that's great. Yeah, no, I'm so glad. I'm so sorry for your loss. What's odd about that is that the last time we were, we recorded our interview for the for the last movie, we had to postpone because your father passed away. It was right before That's that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So now, unfortunately, you were we were ready to go. It was within maybe like forty five minutes. You're like, Rich, I just can't do it. And I said, No, I completely understand. So it's unfortunately, every time we try to record an interview, something bad happens. So uh, uh, hopefully <laughs> if we, when you're on the show next time, which you're going to be on the show next time, it's, it's much better circumstances. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, as I say, when it rains, it pours and these unfortunate uh, things do happen. And uh, you know, it's a part of life and um, you know, we, we always cherish, you know, every memory, every breath, you know, don't take it for granted because one day, you know, you, me, we all have, you know, that date, the date's going to happen. So, you uh-huh. know, t- Take every opportunity. I cannot agree with you more. So sometimes, you know, they always say things happen in threes. You have an actor that you've worked with for a long time. He's been in many of your movies. His name is Tommy Fury. So I want to talk about him. Was he? Did he have a chance to be in the movie that I mentioned that's coming out, Article 92? Uh, no, he hasn't. We've been talking. Um, he's um, He did recently uh, find out. He has uh, cancer. I forget the type, uh, but it's yeah, it's heartbroken. So yeah. you know he's doing the treatments and it's making him very weak. So we tried to get him on board. Um, the stars and moons just have not aligned just because of his schedule and you know the the treatments. And um, I actually did see him um, recently though a few weeks ago. We we picked him up. Uh, me and my production manager Mark Wither and we went to uh, pay our respects to Mario in Rhode Island. So we all carpooled together. So it was a good chance to see him. I haven't seen him. It's been a while just because of everything that's going on with me filming. And then him, you know, obviously with the tragic news, but he's in good spirits. He's actually fighting it. He's uh, winning. So that's, that's always good news. All right. Well, I'm so happy to hear that. Now on to some better news. Let's get to the good stuff. I'm so sorry that you're going through all this because you have such a talented crew and you make so many great movies. The last movie that you were on the show for was Tony Martone. Great that's movie right. about the mob. This one, I can I I haven't seen it yet. I'm not sure if it's released. We're gonna talk about that, but it's called Article 92. So tell my viewers, give them a brief synopsis of what it's about. I love the storyline of this. Yeah, I'll kind of give you um kind of a um a little, little bit of longer Reader's Digest version of it. It's um it's got a couple layers of it, but um you know what's going on in the news, and and we know this, you know this, I know this. The U.S. government's harbor an alien, so that's a little bit about the plot. Mm-hmm. And I wrote this script two years ago. And then finally, the U.S. government got whistleblowed on what they're doing. Not, not that, you know, we didn't know already. But basically what the plot is, it's kind of a sci-fi military thriller slash um, sci-fi action, right? So Dan Ravenport, he's a civilian. He's um, Think of it as he's a washed-up journalist. He just lost his job at the Tribune Times. He's at home. His wife is nagging at him because he's an alcoholic, right? Why wouldn't she be? So he's always getting hammered, right? And um, one day he decided to go for, you know, a car ride. He just, he couldn't take this anymore. The yapping and what, you know, we're not paying our bills, Dan. What's wrong with you? And he's like, I'm going out. And she's like, Dan, it's 3 a.m. Where are you going? He goes for a drive down this dark road. And it takes place in New Hampshire, but we filmed it primarily Connecticut, Mass, Rhode Island. And he's going down this long, dark road. He sees a green light passing over his car. It actually stalls his car out, EMP pulsed. And he's kind of like pushing his stalled car down this uh, bend. And he kind of comes around the corner and he sees the U.S. military who coincidentally are there doing a military exercise. And they first stumbled upon the alien. They're bringing in the roadway. Dan runs over there. He's running. He gets his camera out. He's looking at it, taking pictures. And he's like, you know, he doesn't know if he's drunk or what's happening, but 
the military see him. Long story short, they bring him for questioning. He's now a national security interest because of oh. what he saw. He took pictures. Then, of course, the government, they know who he is. He has that journalist tie. So this is really, really bad for the government because he can whistleblow this and blow this story up. So that's kind of what it's about. But there's more to it. Article 92, the name is um, there's a military code in the uh, United States um, handbook that basically talks about Article 92 is um, a, a disobeying a direct order. So when Dan Ravenport is in for questioning, Sergeant uh, uh, Sergeant Miller is told by the U.S. general to basically kill the kill the civilian. He knows too much. Yeah. And he's like, sir, this is morally wrong. He's like, you know, <clears throat> Article 92, I, I can, you know, court martial you. And he's like, yeah, but that's. That's a lawful order. Or this is a, a unlawful order. I don't feel good about this. So he decides, you know, then the general is like, you know, I could do this to you, blah, blah, blah. And long story short, Sergeant Miller kind of um, goes to his uh, Sergeant Major Barry. He kind of says what's going on. And they agree. Let, let's tell the general we're going to we're going to do this. But what they don't know is they're going to help Dan Ravenport escape from the military complex. Now it's like like a cat and mouse thriller. The they broke him out, and now the military's after him. Mercenaries are after him. So this whole this whole like cat and mouse thing. So you got the, the action, you got the the military drama, you got the sci fi. So that's a little bit about the movie. That, I cannot wait to now. Is this going to be released in the theaters, or is it going to be on streaming services? Uh, it will. Yes, and yes, and yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, we're working on some distribution, but we're actually still filming this. Actually, last weekend when we were supposed to get together. Um, we were actually filming in Watertown, Watertown police in Connecticut. We had them block roads off at Echo Lake Park in Watertown. And we did a scene where this introduces when they kidnap Dan Ravenport's wife for the first time. So we had our drone guy there. We had some nice road shots. And um, uh, but basically, yeah, we have after after that, we have three more scenes we're going to be doing in April. And then we're finally wrapped. So we're still filming right now. But after April, mid-April, we're going to be um, done, and then we can start putting this together. We're working with um, a new composer in Connecticut, Josh Hummel. He's a Connecticut composer, so it's great because we can meet, me and him can meet together. We can look at clips. We can, you know, because music really sets the tone, and you oh, agree yeah. with me, sets the tone for the scene. So it's very important that we find that right blend of music. So I'm really excited to work with Josh for the first time. Uh, cause rewind back, uh, many years ago and he's been doing it for many years. My father who passed away as we, we just heard, he was my composer. Yeah. Um, so no longer on the earth. So now I'm working with other people and, uh, Josh is who I'm working with for this film. And where'd you find him? Um, so I think, um, I meet a lot of people. So sometimes it's, it's really, uh, fuzzy. Yeah. I think he emailed me and he saw what I was doing. He said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm a Connecticut composer and I get these emails, you know, all over people from, you know, California, I get people from all around the world, you know, they introduce themselves and he was kind of talking and I checked him out. He's local. So that really um, appealed to me. And he had a lot of uh, samples on his website and he could really set that, that tone, the, you know, the dark atmospheric music when you Dan Ravenport's going down the dark road, right? We fire blank fire and weapons and Woodbury at like, you know, 2 AM. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and, and then, and we, we actually send letters out, to all the neighbors per the mayor's request, but we, we missed one person because I, I asked the cops who blocked the roads. Hey, just curious, anybody call it in? He's like, you know, there's this one lady who, who heard gunfire and called it in, <laughs> you know, so you never know. You never know. Do you, do you ever hear, I think it's called terrifier. Is that the one, the clown? The reason, I don't know if there's yeah. a movie, there's a reason I bring this up. Cause I interviewed yeah. the guy that made that movie. He was a producer. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, and so he was telling me a story very similar to that. They were filming in the hotel, in a hotel, and it was for their new movie that's coming out. And the guy was in makeup, but he forgot to tell one person who was in the hotel. So she looked through the, the peephole, pulled a gun out, <laughs> and was ready to shoot him. And they're like, no, we're a movie, we're a movie. So oh, yeah, yeah. make sure you tell everybody. So you know, it's, I, I saw the pictures on Facebook. That is very impressive. So now you've got it where you have to alert the local authorities and you have to tell the mayor, you have to go to all the, how do you have to get permission? Is there ever been a time where the one of the neighbors said, no, I really don't want you filming here. I have a kid that, and I don't want all this noise at three o'clock in the morning. You know, it's, it's never happened, but um, respectfully and politely it's um, it's, it's a public road, you know, whether they say no or not. I mean, 
at that point, I, I would, I'm just assuming their arm would really be tied because, you know, we have permission from a higher authority, which would be the mayor. So um, I, I, that's never happened, but, you know, that's a valid point. Yeah. Well, the reason I bring that up, because did you ever, I'm sure you heard of Walter Hill. He directed the Warriors 48 Hours. I interviewed somebody from the Warriors or several people, and they were saying that the, one, the last person I interviewed was a stuntman, but he was also a production assistant. He was the guy that had to go pay off all the different people and there was a store um a street and he had to pay off all the storefronts and they're like well, what do you want me to do just just pay him i don't care but then a couple of the owners found out that they were getting 100 he was I'm, i'll do it for 200 and they were trying to haggle and they said they were going to sue them if they didn't give them 200 dollars. so i was wondering if you ever had to deal with anything like that we're like no i don't care you if you, if you want to use my this neighborhood you better pay me so luckily you haven't had to deal with that yet no 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 sounds like a nightmare but no luckily yeah. i have not had that situation yeah. Now we we've discussed in the past where there was times when you would film and you'd have a permit. It sounds like now you've gone completely legit where you get all the permits, you can film anywhere you want so far as long as you get the permission. And so you, it's not like you're going out there rogue like like in the like in the beginning, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was opportunities where, you know, and and it's not just me. If you look at any Hollywood movie, even, you know, James Cameron in the first Terminator, he would actually there's a scene where I think the station wagon, he runs over the car with Arnold getting out of it. Uh, they had no permit to do that. They just said, hey, hurry up. We're going to get the shot. We're going to do it quickly because, you know, Hollywood, or, you know, California, they're the one of the states that's the worst of, you know, all the red tape and getting all that going. Um, you know, but but yeah, for this one, we're pretty, pretty good. We're following everything to to the T. Um, obviously, you know, if we're on a private property like a residence, you know, we don't have to really de deal much with permits. Um, you know, we just get the owner's permission. Um, so, you know, that's fine. But, um, you know, we did a situation, we did a, actually a, st um, a stunt in Bristol. We actually flipped a car on its roof. Right. So we had a, um, block, um, off, um, roads for four hours, Bristol PD. And then the fire department was on standby. We have a stunt driver who does this for a living. So, you know, I got him the car. Um, you know, he, you know, we talked a little bit before this was happening to be sure everyone's safe. He's like, you know, let's make sure that the gas tank is really, really low. Right. So when we got there, I, I gave him some time for the car. He had to rip the seats out. He changed himself down. I mean, it's really a big deal taking the airbags out, you know, and, and you know, we're not like, you know, $10 million budget. So we don't yeah. have like five, six, seven cars. Right. We got one car, one shot. Um, and we did it. We pulled it off. We got our shot and it worked out and uh, it was fantastic. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about that. I did see some of the pictures on Facebook and you sent me some pictures. And I think that you actually had some great coverage in the Hartford Current, the Waterbury Republican. Yep. So um, I was going to ask you, was it just a brave actor or was it a professional stuntman? So question, where did you find this? Stuntman? Is it again, you just meet all these people and now that you're you're doing more and more movies and people are reaching out to you saying, hey, I'm a stuntman. I would love to uh, work with you. Um, yes and no. I mean, I have a big, big following. Uh, I have a lot of mutual friends. I have about 5,000 friends on Facebook. Uh -huh. So there's yeah. many different avenues. There's many different uh, people um, that I know. Um, and um, the person that did it is, you know, he's, he's, he's very known to do this. He does other stunts too, not just, just uh, cars. He, you know, lights himself on fire. You know, he does, he does, car, you know, general car stunts. You know, his name is Anthony. He's in Massachusetts and he is a um, a stunt. Um, this is what he does. Right. So um, I know who he was and we've been talking kind of like, um, you know, softening this in for a while. You know, I kept talking to him. Hey, I want to you know, I always wanted to do this. So like a couple of years back, I even wanted to do this. But, you know, we, we couldn't find the right road or find the right um, area to do it. But in this film, I'm like, we're flipping a car this time. I know who I'm going to call. It's not Ghostbusters. It's Anthony. And I called Anthony. I said, hey, this is where we're doing this date. Can you be there? And he's like, yep, I got you. So he came down. We got the roads blocked and we, we got it done. And you were saying that it was a one shot only. If you didn't get that shot, there's no way you could do it again. Yeah, I you know. There's there's a lot that could go wrong, too, because um, when you flip a car, there's a basically generally two ways. you can. I mean, there's more, but generally there's two ways you can do it is a pipe ramp where you can just kind of go off of it and then flip yeah. but you know then you have to put a roll cage in it we didn't really have time to do that so we did a, a kind of a soft roll off a, a wooden ramp um that we built but you know there could be things going on when he approaches the ramp you can kind of go off on the side and flip you know he maybe too pre premature or you know maybe the ramp would collapse you know they did a couple tests um with the weight of the car and, it, and the first time they're trying to get the ramp right 
Um, this wasn't a real pass. They would go up on it and, and the weight of the car, it, it broke the ramp. They had to rebuild it, figure that out. But once they got it sound, they were pretty confident that, hey, we got it this time. And they took off one shot, perfect, right over, flipped it. on its roof, rolled back over, and uh, we, we got it. So it, it worked out. Uh, have you ever heard of Troma Pictures, Lloyd Kaufman? You might know the movie Toxic Avenger. Reason, of course. All of right. Course. So the reason I'm, yes. up, I'm sure you know the story with that. Every he had one car scene where the car flipped over and it went so well that he says, I'm going to use this stunt in every single movie. So, what he does is he uses that same clip, he doesn't, it sometimes doesn't even fit in the movie, he just puts it in the movie <laughs> because it came out so well. And he goes, He's like you, he's a well, he's not young, but he's like an independent filmmaker and he doesn't really have a lot of money to play around with. So, he goes, I'm just gonna this works out great, I'm gonna make this work in every single movie I ever have. So, if you ever have that stock footage, you can just throw it in all your other movies that came out so well. I yeah, that's a great point, and, and not only just, just stunts in this film. We actually had a full scale six and a half feet alien made up by monster creator Rob Zipkowski from uh, Arizona. And me and him were talking for a while. He actually he's a very, very big deal, very powerful uh, force, very talented. And I'll tell you a quick story is a TMZ, you know, TMZ, right? The website and, you know, you know, whatever. Right. They actually debunked him because uh, he did a werewolf that was so real that people were posting the pictures that he did saying he was killing people in Costa Rica. And they're like, no, 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 this is not real. This is Rob Zipkowski's work. I mean, that's how detailed he is. So I said, I got to have Rob make me an alien. Right. So we were talking about how we we're going to accomplish this. He said, well, what do you want it to look like? You know, do you want a big head and big eyes? I'm like, you know what? You know, my neighbor down the street looks like that. I mean, everyone, you know, I don't want that. I want something that looks you know, scary and medicine, like, you know, predator that had that, you yes. know, considered an alien, right? Like that creature that would really like be a one-off unique monster. So we're kind of giving him some elements and, you know, he really nailed it. We got this six and a half foot alien that you're going to see in the film article 92. And uh, Rob was the, uh, the guy that pulled that off. Yeah. Well, I saw the picture. It looks very realistic. I love that. I mean, it looked menacing, scary, Real. I, I wanted to ask you about who did that, and you just answered my question. So, where did he is? How long has he been doing makeup? He must have been doing it for a long. Oh time. yeah, he's yeah. been in newspapers, yeah. and I don't know the exact time. I would think it's probably you know, I don't know, yeah. eight, ten years, maybe longer, something like that. But you know, he does a lot of stuff. I mean, the detail in it too. I mean, we're talking about yeah. fingernails. We're talking about you know hair and just you know the the like the glass like teeth and just everything about it the coloring, right? So there's a whole process. I mean, this isn't something that, you know, you can do in like a, you know, a day or two, it takes a long time. You, you, you know, you build your mold out of a, you know, hundreds of pounds of clay, you make the shape and then you get, you know, you get it, um, the silicone around this foam structure to make the shape. You know, he does a couple different things is the one we wanted was this alien was already dead. So we just have him on this, this foam structure to build the shape um, but you can't wear them or anything, but he also makes the silicone stuff that you can wear an actor can wear. So he does that as well. Yeah. So he's very multi-talented and he does pretty much all of what I just said. I mean, Frankenstein, you know, sea monsters, you know, I, actually he did a, a post a clip, um, maybe a few days ago. Uh, he actually matched the actress's face and he had like a bag over. It. It's like a, like a head, like a, yeah. um, a head in a bag. I mean, you know, I mean, just stuff like the police pulled you over, you'd be like, is this guy a serial killer? I mean, that's how good and how, how detailed he is, you know? Oh, my God. Now, is this the first time you've worked with him? It, it was, but I've been following his work. We, yeah. Me and Rob have been talking for a while, and I say a couple, maybe a year or so, maybe a year or two. And I always wanted to get him on board, but it had to be for the right project. And um, Article 92, I was like, I, I got to get Rob involved. And we talked. And, um, you know, and uh, basically... um. I didn't really want to go to Arizona to, to pick it up. So I was like, Rob, you ship. He's like, yes. So I got this like huge package. Right. And and the guy's like hauling off the, the, the male guy. And it's like 55 pounds. He's like the hell's in here. I'm like an alien. He's like, Oh, you're funny. I'm like, no, I'm serious. There, there's an alien in there. He didn't believe me, but, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. all it is, is uh, just finding the right people to make your vision come alive. Yeah, and you are finding all the right people. And it's funny, that story you told me reminds me of something that happened. There's a, an Italian movie that came out in the 70s called Cannibal Holocaust. And there's a scene in there where the woman is impaled. It was so real in the movie. 
they accused the director of murder. They had to bring the actress into court to prove that he didn't really murder her because it was so realistic. So it's funny that <laughs> your makeup artist had to be debunked. It's like, no, come on, that's not real. I want to get back to the score for a minute, though, because I saw a documentary yeah. entitled Score, and I find this fascinating. I love the, the whole, like you said before, the music sets the whole tone, and people don't realize that the reason they're crying in a movie, the reason they're scared in a movie, it's not really the movie. It's the music. The, the, fills you with emotion fills you mm -hmm. with fear makes gives you a jump scare when they need it and i i my favorite all-time music composer is john williams i just love his work i think he's oh like, yeah you me too yep. yeah so i was watching a documentary on him as well he was in that he was heavily featured in that but then i went down that rabbit hole on youtube you might like this and they were i was watching when he was working with george lucas and george lucas would say all right here's 10 minutes of star wars and he'd come back all right i have this all right here's 20 more minutes he came back with that now with things have changed since the 70s so with your composer would you just do the whole movie first and then give it to him and say make something make a score with this and also the other question i want to add to that and you can answer everything is i know the director usually goes through with the composer and says i don't want music here keep this silent put music here keep this part blank so did you do something similar with your composer um, well, we, yeah, um, to answer that is uh, we actually uh, we're setting our first meeting up soon. We actually haven't gotten together yet. We were supposed to get together um, sometime in March, but um, we had some scenes got pushed back because uh, of like snow and COVID and it delayed that. So um, but when I do meet with him, um, I'm not going to give him like everything at once. We're going to really have these focused meetings to to just go over one clip at a time yeah what do i want here where i want the music what kind of music any reference music um you know whether it's atmospheric if, whether there's um you know tension risers tension build up you know and to kind of work it at a more of a personal level so he's not overwhelmed so that's how i'm kind of approaching it with him yeah no it sounds great it's funny because well in that documentary going back to this they said that sometimes they'll have the billboards of the movies already up ready to go the movie will be released may 25th memorial day and the composer's like holy shit, I have nothing prepared. What am I going to do? <laughs> so they, they already had the movie promote being promoted before the, the composer comes in and does his stuff. So it's, uh, but do you, do you have an idea already in your head how you want the music to be? A little bit. I mean, there's some scenes that, especially like the, the dark road scene I was describing where he's walking down. We had a smoke machine, so it's very airy, right? Very dark. We have the alien there, the military trucks. You know, it's like two in the morning. We got these, you know, he takes a road flare out, you know, he's like going down the road. So it's, you got the color, right? The reds, yeah. you got the smoke, you got a little blue moonlight. So it looks very, very good. So I, I have a very good idea of like that airy type of music. So I'm going to give him some of the reference that I think that would work to really sell that, uh, that, that, that scene, you know, and there's some other scenes I really haven't given much thought about. Like there's a lot of powerful scenes, uh, not to mention, I didn't mention this, but you probably already know, maybe you don't. Um, we actually went to the United Kingdom for a scene, but this is an international yeah. indie film, which this, you don't hear about that too much, right? Usually films and the independent level, they're, they're either filmed in, you know, either one location, whether it's, you know, wherever, but we filmed in Connecticut, Mass, Rhode Island and the United Kingdom. We went to a Oval Office replica at, uh, October, um, studios and we filmed our U S president scenes inside their oval office mm -hmm. and that's what i'm getting to is uh there's a lot of powerful dialogue from the u.s president who wants to keep this quiet so there's going to be certain kind of music i really want to to sell that kind of like some powerful you know risers kind of evil like not not you know like um evil in the sense where it's um really known evil but that kind of like dark yeah. atmospheric evil music airy music and like wow this guy you know he's He's in it too. He wants Dan Ravenport to pay whatever it takes. No loose ends, right? The U.S. government. So, so the, yeah, that's the story about that. We went to United Kingdom, so that was really, really fun. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that because I did, I did see the pictures of this. Also, is this your first time filming outside of the United States? It, yes, yes, it was, and um, it was kind hmm. of um, um, a funny story of, about that. Was is that we we went down to our uh, we flew to london me and uh, bruce church bruce played u.s president in my film president Lowell, mm -hmm. and i took him down we went to london and the reason we went to london now the studio from london is about a three-hour drive so you're like well why would you go to london and drive three hours and and not to mention i'm driving i'm a u.s citizen i've never driven in london before so i'm not just driving five minutes i actually drove 
through London three hours and like for my first time, you know, and um, the reason we picked London though, is there's a lot of friends of mine, David Perlmutter, um, who's one, another author I met in 2015. He's also been in a lot of movies. He was in uh, the gentleman. He was background extra and guy Ritchie's the gentleman on Netflix and a lot of other things. And he played the um, prime minister um, in one of the scenes at the, the white house. And, and I, he's from London. So I, there's two other people that were with him. So we went to London because we picked them up and then we drove the three hours to the film studio. That's the reason why we went to London first. Now, London's kind of like New York with, with certain individuals because a lot of people, uh, some drive, but some don't, right? They rely on like the train or whatever. Uh, so these guys kind of relied on that, but they're, they're not taking a three hour <laughs> train. I don't even think there is a train. It was in Norwich, UK, like Norfolk County in the UK. So there's no way they're getting there. So I was like, it's all right, guys. We'll go to London. We'll go to the airport. We'll stay there, pick you guys up, and we'll all go in a car and let, let this American drive you because I know what I'm doing, right? So that's what we did. Joe's in charge. Don't worry about it. We heard yeah. you in control. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you wrote the script, you said, several years ago. When you I were did. writing it, did you already have in mind that you wanted to do some filming in the UK? I didn't. I did oh. not. Uh, it was. Um, I did write, obviously, about the US president, but I didn't really – Vision and actually came across an article on BBC UK or one of those uh, United Kingdom publications. And they actually mentioned that the United Kingdom has a, um, a replica to the spec of the current Oval Office. I mean, the dimensions, it's the same. I mean, it's like the real deal. So I was like, oh, OK. And I saw this. I'm like, let me make a phone call. I'm going to talk to these guys. Hey, we want to come down there. How much is it going to cost? And he gave me the price. I'm like, well. Yeah, that sounds good. But how about this? You know, so we're talking a little bit and I got a good deal on it and it made sense and we budgeted it out and it worked out. So that must have been fun. Did you have to did you have to bring the alien with you? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately. Uh, well, there is a scene you'll see in the beginning of the movie. We actually filmed. They have the, the, like they have like these bunkers down in the United Kingdom. Not, not to mention where we filmed was a former military base in the UK. They turned into a production house, which is good for us because they had these military bunkers. And one of the scene is the, the kind of these bomb shelter doors. They open up like this, right? And they open up and uh, the US president, you can kind of see his eyes, you know, he's, the doors are open and you see him, he's looking around. He's like, take me to the alien. So it's like a cut in yeah. to him arriving at Fort Braxton, which is a fictitious military base. Um, in the United States. So in this clip, he's actually there to see the alien. He wants to see him. That's where he's being held. Even though we don't see him, we don't really need to. It's just a cut in of him establishing he's there. He wants to see the alien. Yeah. I just think it would be kind of funny trying to take that through the airport. <laughs> Say, oh, excuse me, what do you, what do you have in the bag, sir? Oh, nothing. We're, we're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that would be funny. That would really, really be a funny story. When you got down there, when when you were filming, what were the locals? What was the locals' reactions? Were they crowding around and were they interrupting your filming? No, this is uh, this is um, actually a closed production house. So like, oh good, it's all it's all indoor. It's all uh, pre uh, st pre standing sets that and, like they have a security uh, guard. Uh, it's a real deal. Like nobody knows we were there, so we just went in, went to the security guy, we checked in, and and it was really weird. Like this is like in the country of like. United Kingdom, like, you know, we're driving, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to London, but I'm sure you've seen photos, Yeah. you know, the big city, right? The double decker buses, you know, the big buildings, the very old buildings. Then we hit the country. We're talking to like, you know, just grass and farmland and, you know, these big, like, um, um, you know, weeds and stuff and dirt roads. Like we're like way out there, like, you know, so yeah, nobody bothered us. It was completely like a close set and it was just us there just doing what we had to do. Did you use any actors from the UK or do you use all the actors from the US? Um, I just brought one, uh, Bruce Church from he's from Rhode Island. And then my my uh my friend David Polarmutter, he was already in London. His friend Ray Burke. Um, he was actually also he does a lot of background. He was in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire in the background. Um, and then um his friend Michael um was there. And then we also had another guy, um, Alexander Garcia. He's from um the UK. He's he does a lot of films down there a lot of skits with uh eddie hall the beast he was one of the straw men in the uk yeah. he did a lot of a lot of those funny videos where you know you can see eddie hall driving the tank around the uk and he's he's down there with him and he does a lot of movies as well a lot of like mafia he's got that look to him like you know tough guy look yeah uh but he was just i just put him in a suit i said hey you're gonna be the secret service to the prime minister 
He's like, yep, count me in. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so it. I had a couple of their guys do that. And then, um, then I had, um, you know, my guy, the U S president do all like the very powerful phone call scenes, you know, Hey, we got a situation in Concord, New Hampshire, you know, civilian Dan Ravenport, you know, he saw this. So he's trying to gather information, what to do and, you know, informing the president on the phone. So we got that powerful phone call scene and, and just some other follow-up phone call scenes. So beautiful, beautiful location and beautiful set down there though. I cannot wait to see it. Now, are you at the point which you've made a lot of movies? You use a lot of some of the same people. One of the people that you use is a mutual friend of ours, Mark Wither. You mentioned him before. I've known him for mm -hmm. years. Uh, so now, are you at the point where you really don't have to have auditions for people, or you you just know like I'm when you're writing a part? Oh, I already have somebody in mind for this one. He's going to be perfect for this. Or do you say, all right, I'm going to have an open audition and let's see who does it the best? Yeah, I kind of do it both. I mean, I have an idea. I mean, we have a lot of um, we were fortunate enough to have a lot of powerful people. Mark Werther, he plays General Bronson in this film. Mm -hmm. He does a really good job. But all the roles, we did open auditions. Um, and I actually held them. I don't remember when, what month. It's kind of a blur to me because I've been filming since September of 2023 for this one. But before we started filming, we did our new um, auditions, I think, in either the Newington Library or the Glastonbury Library. It, it kind of escapes me right now. But all the roles that I need, even though I have somebody like Airmark, I still want everyone to go through the Rainer. Um, even the people I got Airmark, go through the Rainer. Let me see how you do this. And then I just really want to pick the best, um, you know, person for the for the right role. Because like, you know, maybe um, I had this person Airmark for here, but when he auditioned, I think he's going to be better here. So I had to make the adjustment and then I offer them, you know, the, the proper role. So, so you have the final decision. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I bring everyone through the auditions. And then I, because um, um, I, because a lot of people in, in in the movie industry, you know, there's different, um, usually different responsibilities, right? You have a writer, yeah. then you have a director, then you have a DOP. Well, in, in this particular film, I am the writer, I am the director, I am the DOP, right? So yeah. when I wrote it, it's very important for me to see who I envision to really pull off that role. And I could see it when they're performing it because I'm the DOP as well and the director. So I can kind of see, yeah, this person is good, but, you know, his emotion might be better here or you know, it might be better that way or this way. So, yeah, I kind of like that's really important to me to really find that right person, um, you know, for the role. Do you take out all these roles because you like having total control over your movie? It's your vision. You know exactly what you want. Or is it just more because of budget constraints? Um, That's a good question. I mean, um, it's probably more personal to me that that I make those decisions. You know, if I wanted to hire a casting director, I mean, I could. Yeah. Um, they could do all the legwork, but you know, this is more of a, a personal meaning to me. So I, I'd rather just handle it myself for now for, for this one, at yeah. least. Well, it's funny. I interviewed an actor last year sometime and we were in the middle of the interview and he mentioned you, he worked with you, Peter Anthony. Yeah, I, I know Peter. Uh, yeah. yeah. And he's a Connecticut guy as well. And, um, he's a yeah, he did guy. a lot of great things. Uh, he did, uh, this movie, the laugh yes. and, um, I provided him the Russian uniforms for that film. Like I have this so many props where right? I have Russian officer jackets, I have U S military police uniforms, um, you know, everything like that. So he was kind of telling me about it. I'm like, yeah, I got that. I'll, I'll uh, let you use that. So, you know, he gave me like the um, prop wardrobe credits or what have you. Yep. And um, yeah, so he's, yeah, he's great. And that looks really, really good. So I can't wait to see that one as well. Laugh. Yeah, no, I saw, I saw the trailer for, it. I cannot wait. I met him. At the Strand Theater, they show older horror. Actually, they show older horror movies, but they also show sometimes independent movies, which I think it would be great to have see your movies there too, on the screen. But um, they showed him because he's a huge Friday the Thirteenth fan. He does a lot of the uh, not reimaginings, but like his take on the Friday Thirteenth series. And so they were showing a couple of his movies. I saw. I got to have you on the show. And then in the middle of talking, like because I saw I saw Mark Withers' name on the credits. I'm like, like how do you know Mark? And that sort of opened up. Uh... Oh my god, yeah, I worked with Joe. And so what movie for you was he in? Uh, so for Peter Anthony, he did a, he did a role in a movie called Four Bobby. It was one of my short films. We actually filmed that in Wallingford, Connecticut. Oh. We had like a Dodge Aspen, a nice yellow, you know, car that, you know, you don't see too often. And he basically played one of like the gang, one of the gang guys, right. That was, um, going to buy drugs from, <laughs> from Tommy Fury and some other guys. And the deal kind of went sour and some words were said, and let's just say bullets were blazing and, uh, <laughs> So he that's kind of the role he played. You know, I could I could picture that. I could definitely <laughs> picture that. 
You know, it's funny. I think I saw in some of the pictures, because you mentioned you have so many different kinds of uniforms, like Russian uniforms. Mm-hmm. I saw one of the pictures when you were filming this movie, you had a gang jacket on. That might have been for the for Bobby movie. Uh, no, actually, yeah. So the uh, the gang jacket um, one is actually my director prop. That's actually for my next film. Actually, coincidentally, oh. the, the film that I had that made for was supposed to be done before article 92 just because of a lot of logistics and yeah. what we needed we decided to reverse them and do article 92 first it's called when the sun dies oh, that's it and that's the jacket that I had on and we actually you know i love cars right i mentioned the dodge aspen before in this particular film we were fortunate to use a ford ranchero which is like an el camino but ford made it. a lot of people don't know about this car i didn't really know much about it but it's beautiful it had a 351 windsor in it very loud so we had that that car we used when we blocked the roads in Watertown on uh, March 17th. We filmed that scene with the Ford Ranchero, and it came out really good because the guy that played it, his name is Stephen Cars. He's from uh, New Jersey, and he plays like he's supposed to be like this used car salesman, right? He sees Dan Ravenport pull over. He's lost, but he knows who he is. He's tracking him. He's following him. And uh, he gets out. He's like, you got to get rid of that piece of crap. You know, this this is a classic car. You got to get one of these. Come come look at this. You know, he revs the engine. And he's like, no, no, I'm good. But he's just playing with him. And, and he's like, you know what? What you want is in my trunk. You got to check this out. Guess what is in the, in the trunk? His wife. Oh. He doesn't go back far enough to see it. So it's a little little funny comedic thing. Yeah. He's like, no, I'm good. And he gets back in the car and they take off. And uh, it's a funny scene, you know, down there that we did. So you're you're way ahead. You do a lot of writing. It sounds like so you had like you had that movie already done. You were you were gonna make you had this already written. So how, do you have how many more how many scripts do you have written so far that you can just go and film? Well, I have about four in my head that I just got to uh, dump on the paper. That's how I yeah. do it a lot. Yeah. Um, I have the general idea, the hook, any twist, and I just develop characters. Uh, when the sun dies, that's the one that I'm supposed to do. That I kind of put on the back burner yeah. with the jacket. Um, that's already written. It's like I think it's like I don't know, ninety-five pages. It's going to be a feature when we do the do that. But I have some other some other ideas in my head that are just kind of floating in there until I uh, have time to um, r- write about them. Because you know, this particular film, since September twenty twenty-three, we're filming. We filmed at the Connecticut Air Museum. I mean, big deal behind the B twenty-nine bomber for one of the scenes in the Fort Braxton. I mean, we filmed in the Talon Jail Museum, right right in Talon, Connecticut, for one of the jail scenes. I mean, we filmed in, uh, where else did we film? Um, we filmed in the Wichenden uh, Mansion, which is allegedly haunted in Massachusetts for the general's residence. Wow. Um, we filmed in just a lot of really, really cool locations. You know, we had the Air Museum, like I mentioned, the jail, um, and and so many more I'm, I'm forgetting just really epic fight scenes as well. I mean, we had a lot, a lot of, a lot of fighting. So you're going to see, you know, action, you know, fighting, uh, these mercenaries are angry. They're mad. They want Dan Ravenport. And, uh, there's a twist in this film. I'm not going to ruin, but, um, it's going to be there. You're going to, you're not even going to see it coming, um, at the end. It's going to be great though. I'm very much looking forward to this movie. So I'm guessing, DOP writer, director, producer. You're also the location scout as well. You're the one who picks all the locations. <laughs> uh, I am, but not all of them. If I kind of get stuck in a rut, or you know, I need to, um, you know, I, I, um, Bill Gannon. I don't know if you know Bill. Do you know Bill Gannon? I don't. No. He's uh, he's another one. Peter Anthony knows him as well. Mark Wither. He's my um, look. He's actually my official location manager oh. when I kind of get in a rut because I know a lot of people and he does as well. Yeah. He's got a lot of connections, so I might go to him if I get stuck on something. I said, "Hey, Bill, I need this. Can you you make some phone calls?" And he'll jump on it, you know, and try to get it for me. And uh, it really works out well. So, yeah, he's actually in this film as well, Bill again, and he plays one of the um the, one of the mercenaries. That, oh, we uh, filmed at um, Town Plot Auto in Waterbury uh, for the uh, there's a big fight and a big gun battle in, in the in the like tow yard over there. And, uh, you know, shout out to Chris, the owner. Um, I know him and Mark Weather knows him. I said, hey, Chris, uh, could you put like two cars over here and can you lay one right on top? He's like, yeah, I got you. So he's like, get the forklift. He's laying a car on top. We're walking it. under it for the scene. I mean, just, you know, you can't get that. I mean, you can't beat that, right? You know, getting getting what you want. That is great. Now, for I'm guessing for these scenes, like at the Air Museum, you had to go after hours. There's no way that you, were you filming when the public was walking through or? No, 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 okay, no, no. no. So, yeah. so this is like, I think we filmed, it was on a weekend. I don't remember which day, but they closed that four, whatever day it was. And we filmed from four to nine. 
when it was shut down. Um, you know, so we we uh, basically picked the hanger we wanted to use, and it's just uh, basically uh, some powerful scenes, you know, in front of the um, the B twenty nine, and then we had a scene in front of one of the jeeps that's in front of another airplane, and then we had uh, some dialogue um, in front of another airplane at the corner of the uh, of the hanger. So it worked out really really well for that. Yeah. So do you? I know you're still working on it. Do you have an idea of when this movie is going to be released eventually? Like, do you have a, a set? Yeah. Movie? Yeah, I would say um, December, maybe January, February next year, something like that. It all depends. You know, knock on wood, we don't have any, um, once we schedule these last scenes in April, you know, maybe if someone gets sick again or, you know, the cat has puppies or whatever, or, you know, something happens, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, uh, it would kind of prolong that. But right now, hopefully December, January, February 2025, end of this year, December or 2025, January, February. Well, I know for Tony Martone, I, I'm going to try. Um, if you have the same thing, I'm going to definitely make make a make an um, priority to go to this because last year or last time I talked to you for Tony Martone, you had it at the stadium in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and you I did all the works. You had red carpet, you had interviews, you had trailer. I mean, it was such. I saw the pictures and I said, "Oh, I wish I knew in advance. Mm -hmm. I wish I was able to get the day off." So, are you doing the same thing for Article Ninety Two? We are. We are. We don't know the location. We're still um, we're working the logistics out of where yeah. it's going to be, but we will have the same kind of um, the thing we do is generally is we'll have a red carpet premiere that's open to the public, too. Right. So, you yeah. know, how many I call it an experience. Right. How many movies were you able to go as a public and sit with the actors that are in the movie? I mean, you're literally looking over like, hey, he's in the movie. He's sitting right next to me. I mean, that's that's an experience. Right. So. Yeah. This red carpet experience will happen. We'll have the red carpet, the backdrop, our sponsor backdrop again. I love it. Um, we'll have the pictures. We'll have interviews backstage. It's going to be a grand time again. I cannot wait. So hopefully sometime in December. Yep. Yep. That's yep. we're we're hoping. Now I want, I want to get back to the writing because you mentioned it was approximately 90 something pages. Do you write in a screenplay format or do you write it as a short story slash novel? Uh, no, I use um, a screenwriting software. I use uh, Trellby, Trellby, which is like screen screen um, script software. You know, basically it kind of formats certain things for you. Yeah. And then you just put the character names in it. Then you put your dialogue in it. Um, so I just put everything in that. And then I'll just export the script and I'll send the sides to the actors. You know, you're on call for this day. You're on call for that day. You know, everything is is ready to go. I have like extras printed out, you know, during, during the time we film. So everyone's acclimated, you know, we do some dry rehearsals if needed while we're setting up and um, just making sure everything is, 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 you know, as um, correct that as I want it to be, as far as whether it's emotions or, you know, blocking of the shot, you know, we want to make sure everything is, um, you know, ready, ready to go. Do you write it? in a shorthand first on paper and then put it into the format like and then how many drafts does it usually take no all from my head right on to, right on uh oh. yeah, right onto the the software and there's a few final adjustments um but right when i write there's it may, might be two revisions I, I don't really change up too much but yeah. when i'm filming i might make some subtle changes some subtle changes and along the way but it's you know for the best because i might have like another idea that kind of equates into this this scene or that scene yeah. so i might change up a couple you know small parts of the movie um i do that occasionally as well and then also what i do is um certain scenes is i'll say uh, i might write like like little descriptions of what's going on and i'll be like guys improv here's what's going on what? improv so like this film i think we did two scenes i just kind of gave him the general idea of what's happening where i want you to go with it improv so we did that and i always throw a little bit of improv into the film because I think it gives the the actor the range and creativity to really, um, I, as they're learning about the character, they're building, they're they're selling them as a character, but also gives them open range to go beyond the pages of the words to make their own little um, scene come alive. And I think that's important for you know actors growing as well. So that's why I do it. Yep. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was going to ask you this. Because I interviewed an actor that worked both with Clint Eastwood and Martin Scorsese. And Scorsese has exactly what you just said. He said he was in The Wolf of Wall Street. He says, just go in there. You're a financial guy. Just start talking. And he said that he got the part because he was actually a financial guy 
before he started getting to movies. So he knew all the lingo. And he's like, oh man, just keep going with this. And he said he he really wants his actors to be able to improv and be able to do this. But Clint Eastwood is one take only. He goes, I don't care. I want it fresh. Let's just go on. Forget it. I don't, so for you, I mean, unless I mean, if you get the shot in the first try and the first time, do you say, okay, let's move on? Or do you say, let's try it again a different way or let's try it a little bit more emotion? What's your style? Yeah, I mean, it's never just one and done because, you know, when we film, we do have multiple cameras, but, you know, I, I like a variety of shots, right? So, like, I might do a wide, then I got my close-ups, right, of, yeah. you know, that powerful, you know, you can see your eyes and emotion. So, usually with the scenes, I, I'm going to do them, like, three, four, or five times just because different angles and, you know, di different looks of the film. So, when I do my cutbacks, you know, I have my wide and I can kind of get closer. I could, Or if there's multiple people, I got my two-shot and, and then I can go go to a, a close up. So for me, it's always going to be just multiple shots and just picking, you know, the right version of that multiple shot that really comes to comes to life. You know. Now, how many cameras do you normally use? Uh, generally, it depends on the day, like who's available. I have um, two cameras that I use, and uh, Mark Wither, my production manager, brings his. So um, on a good day, we'll have three always, you know, rolling. But uh, sometimes we might have um, you know, only one or two. Um, you know, but that's why we, we like our variety of shots just to get those different angles and, um, you know, close ups or, you know, different things. And, you know, there's some issues that come along the way as well. Um, we had a scene we did in um, 317 where, uh, you know, this is small things you don't think of is um, we had a lot of drone shots get coverage of these two cars, a Ford Ranchero and, and another car. We, we had them come around the corner. First take. Beautiful. Second take, somehow his lights are on. We're like, how did your headlights get on? So we had to do it again. No, no, you got to go back. We did it again, lights are off. Then we did a third take. Somehow the, the, the auto button or something, right? Third take, his lights are on again. I'm like, the lights are on again. We have to do this again. So there's this small things you're going to see along the way that, you know, you got to um, be aware of them because if you don't, you're going to have, you know, you're going to be forced to only be able to use like maybe one or two shots, right? Because if I didn't notice that, and I have um, a scene where he's going down with, with no headlights and I have a scene coming down with headlights. I just got to pick one or the other. But if I catch it and do it multiple times, now I have the, the right cutbacks where I can pick from the drone shot to my to me in the street. Right. You know, but if I didn't catch that, then I'd be like I'd be strong armed to use one or the other. Right. You know. Yeah. No, I, I agree with it. It's like, it reminds me of uh, listening to like the early Steven Spielberg, which uh, ironically was uh, happened on my favorite UFO movie of all time so far until Article 92 comes out. But um, <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I love that movie. And I was I, I have the book of the making of it, and he, they said he was so into detail, he would just wait until the lighting was just right so it would match the day before. And if the people that were, somebody somebody was in there in the last shot, they had to wait, let's move this, it has to be right here. It was just down to the, the minute details. And that's what it was all about. And people do notice that. They're like, wait, what's that? So some people would say, oh, come on, don't worry about it. Nobody's going to pay attention. But yeah, they do pay attention. So I love the fact that you take so much care into all the details that nobody would might not even think about. Yeah, you're right. And, and not just that, right? So this film takes place in New Hampshire. So I went on eBay. I bought 20 New Hampshire license plates, right? So that's when cool. these cars are coming, mostly these actors are from Connecticut or Mass. So before we film, I'm changing license plates, right? Because we're in New Hampshire. So, you know, like the lead actor, he's got to have a car that has New Hampshire plates. So yeah. I got to make sure of all these plates, I got to run back to daily and make sure I use the same plate for him. Because if I shoot one scene where his plate number is like 327, then two days later, he's 397 or 417. Like, how did that happen, right? So you got to be on the top of these things, right? With, you know, the matching license plates and, and all that. So that's all important. Question for you. How can you just go and buy... 25 license plates where do you where do you do that you'll go to dmv i'm guessing no 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 so like um so ebay like you know and oh. a lot of people in garage right these are expired plates okay. they, they consider it as novelty plates like you know you go to garage they have like all these old license yeah. plates hanging up so like these i think expired like i don't know in like 2022 20, 25 okay. uh, but from a distance you can see new hampshire but you don't really care about the little sticker that's this big you're gonna see yeah. You know, so that's how I get them is I just get them off eBay and, and find what I need, you know. Yep. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because when I was doing my research, you mentioned Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, UK. I also saw Hawaii and Florida. Did you film there as well? Uh, good question and uh, good research. But no, no, I didn't. What you're what you're referring to 
is, you know, the outreach outreach of this film is unbelievable. We're talking about actors. Um, it's it's actors where they're from, right? So Connecticut. Wow. Right? We had actors from mainly from Connecticut, Mass, and Rhode Island, but we had one person from um uh Hawaii, we had another person from California, we had people from New York, we had people um all over the place just come down to be to be part of this because you know they want to be so that's what you're referring to is the hawaii okay. we had the hawaii connection because we had somebody travel from hawaii to a scene we did in um holly mass uh my my um friend ben has this like this beautiful place like in holly mass i mean we're talking about a remote place because I, I, I said to ben hey ben you know we're gonna get hungry we're gonna order some pizza you know, where's the closest pizza in town? He laughed at me. He's like, Joe, you know, I'm in the boonies. We don't even have police here. State police has to come. We don't even have, we don't have any of that. The pizza place is like two towns over. I mean, that's how remote we are. I wanted this like remote, you know, area where they're hiding out on. And, and you can't get any more remote than that. Right. You know, that's right. Now, are all these people professional actors or the people that you knew? Yeah, the, I would say about uh, 95% all professional. Wow. There are a few people, um, you know, a lot of, there's some extras as well, or even featured um, extras who have, you know, a line or two, and they do a hell of a job. But yeah, it's about 95% people who very take this very seriously, right? They do, you know, films all around their region, you know, they travel, they go to different places, um, and, and they really take the, the, the craft seriously. So, um, but we do have, um, a few small roles that are open to a couple lines for, for kind of a up and coming um, as well. So, and, you know, everyone's killing it. I mean, we're all coming together. This is really a journey, you know, since uh, September, 2023 that we've been doing and here we are, we're, we're almost done. So. Wow. Congratulations. Now budget wise, I want to ask you about this because I know some actors and actually not actors, some directors. And one of the people doing this is the, the, the person who did terrifier for his latest movie he puts something online and if you donate money, if you give $25, you can have a, a credit. If you do $100, you can have a credit and also have a scene in the movie. Do you have anything like that, where you, a Kickstarter where people can put money to help you make this movie made or is it all money that you have? Yeah, no, we did that. We um, we did have a um, a campaign. That's where we found a couple of our producers, associate producers. Um, we did have like producer credits where yep. they kicked an X amount of movie. They, you know, they want their name in the the producer credit, and on and on IMDb, the Internet Movie Database. So we had a lot of that happen from there. You know, then we had a, some other um, perks that they can get, like signed scripts, you know, DVDs, stuff like that. So we yep. did have uh, much success in that um that helped us um you know raise because i mean this is i mean you know you know movie business it's not not cheap right so i mean yeah. just to do a car stunt for example we're talking about you know paying paying a driver to do the stunt a professional right we're talking about closing roads talking about the fire department on standby that was almost uh 4500 just to do that wow i mean right i mean you know and then my alien was around around that same price as about 4500 i mean all of these things add up. I mean, and, and, and I'm only talking about two things I just named and that, that was almost, um, you know, I don't know, nine grand. Right. So that's yeah. just two days, just nine grand right there. I mean, we're talking about, <laughs> it, it all adds up. And then, you know, then you got food, of course, catering, you know, you got, um, you know, your blood work, you got, you know, closing roads, you got, you know, just all those other things that, you know, you need to do as well. I'm sure the actors want to get paid as well. So, Oh, of course, of course there is that as well. I mean, <laughs> You know, everything adds up. And, um, you know, that's why I just love to see what the actor will do with the role. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, when I was looking for um, Dan Ravenport, he's a lead. Um, St Stephen Hug, by the way, plays Dan Ravenport. And um, he's an older gentleman. If you look at him, he looks like a rocker. I mean, you know, gray beard, long hair. Um, he's like, yeah, he looks like a washed up journalist. So I'm like, hey, Steve, I'm going to make you this washed up journalist who's an alcoholic. He's like. Oh, that's great, Joe. Because I, I don't, I don't touch beer. I'm, I don't even drink beer. I'm like, well, you pulled it off. Because when he's getting like hammered at the bar, like he does it so well. Like it's, it's, it's amazing, right? There's that's a scene funny. where, funny scene in the beginning of the movie. He goes to the bar. We filmed this in, um, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, at the White Ash Cigar Bar. My friend Don, the owner, props yeah. to Don. Um, so he comes in there, uh, Dan Ravenport, he's pulling out like his hands out of his pocket. Bear cans are falling out as he's entering the bar. Like that's how hammered this guy is, right? So he goes over there and uh, the uh, the bar owner is like, hey, uh, you know, Dan, you want the, you know, 
You want the the regular? It's like, yeah, give me a beer. And he's like, all right, I just need to put it on your tab. So he, he goes to hand him his credit card. He's so hammered already going to the bar. He pulls out his library card. <laughs> he's like, that that's your library card, you know? So he knows this guy is trouble, you know? So that's who Dan Rappaport is, is he's this raging alcoholic. And um, he's just having these, these rough patches. And, you know, Stephen really sold that, that uh, role very, very well. It'd be very convincing for someone who doesn't even drink. When you see the film, you're going to be like, wow, this guy's good. He probably goes home and just gets hammered. Well, no, he doesn't. I mean, he really doesn't. So <laughs> that's what acting is all about, is being believable. I know. That's what gets me mad. We could talk about this like another conversation. But when people will say, oh, this actor can't play this because they're not that. Or this actor, actress can't play this because it's like, that's what acting is. They're playing something they are not. So, yes, exactly. you can't play that. So now what do you have to hire an alcoholic to play an alcoholic? You can't have somebody who's sober to play an alcoholic. It's just, yeah, I think with the way the movie, the, they're try, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to be more inclusive, but in a way, it's making it worse because now you can't win an Oscar or anything without having this, 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 or this. If you miss any one of them, well, you're not eligible. It's like, what do you mean? It's, it's like, so I, I think that they're maybe they're trying to do a good thing, but it's gone way overboard. So I just was thinking that's funny because pretty soon it'd be like, well, he's not an alcoholic. So why would you, you have to hire a real alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. It's, it's, you're right though. That's the beauty of acting. Yeah. Did you, did he do a lot of improv on this, in this movie? Um, yeah, there was a scene uh, we did at Echo Lake on uh, the 317. I told, I told Steven, Hey, improv so um when he w approached the car that was trying to you know sell him you know the car and his wife he did a really 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 great good job i think he has like only like two improv scenes for the entire movie we're talking about like 28 days of filming um uh, but still i mean you know he for 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 the dialogue that i read he really really conveyed that well and um he did an awesome job and the improv gave him that that playground to play in and he did an awesome job there so i, I can't wait to to have everyone see what we're doing with this. I mean, we're talking about, you know, civilians, there's aliens. He's going to try to whistleblow this. He's running from these mercenaries. They're trying to kill him. He's got his brother, Brad Ravenport. He's a former like intelligence. So he kind of comes to his rescue and like, you know, messes these other mercenaries up. He tries to, you know, protect his brother. Uh, but it's funny. They weren't talking because uh, Dan Ravenport slept with his sister. <laughs> <laughs> so he, in the beginning of the movie, when he's at the bar with the library co card that I was telling you about, he calls his brother. He's like, Brad, you know, I haven't, we, we haven't talked in a while. I'm sorry for sleeping with your sister. Call me back. Like He wants to talk to him. But Brad, because he's in the intelligence industry, he knows Ravenport's in trouble. So he puts behind those differences and kind of comes to his brother's rescue. I love it. So it's almost like the real housewives meets close encounters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. This movie has everything. <laughs> it really does. There's, there's some, you know, funny, funny lines and, and, um, you know, it's, it's got that comedy. It's got that suspense, the alien, the action, the fighting. I mean, we're talking, you know, we're using breakable, um, props in Watertown. We filmed at Gail's farm shop. Uh, my, my, my friend Gail, uh, we did this, this really, really awesome scene where, uh, Brad Ravenport, you know, he's a bigger guy. And one of the mercenaries is in there um, to kill Brad or to kill Dan. But Brad knows that they're coming there. So he comes over there and these mercenaries, they're walking down with their guns and um, they basically see him. So, bam, one of them hits him with a coffee mug, falls, they start fighting. And then Brad Ravenport tries to um, go after the woman. There's women mercenary in this, too. She goes after this woman. She puts him in like a leg lock around around uh, Brad's head. Brad lifts him and throws him over another table. Like, you know, he's a big guy, like woof. And then they start going at it. Like just crazy stunts in this. We have um another mercenary uh, played by Autumn Dickinson, who's in um, Massachusetts. Basically what happens again, Brad Ravenport goes up to her and she actually flips him over, over her shoulder and just like falls right to the ground. We have Sean Burke on board. He's um he, he actually did some training with, um, uh, Rory Gracie, who was in the UFC, like he did a lot of stunts for them. So he's got like, I don't know, black belt. And I don't know if he's third degree, fourth degree, but he, he really helped with a lot of the stunts in this, a lot of the chokes and uh, some of the stuff that we did. Um, we really practiced. We really got it down really, really, really well. You're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of fighting in this one, too. I, as I mentioned about three or four times, every time you start bringing up a new scene, I cannot wait to see this. Every time, <laughs> the more you talk about it, the more excited I get. So like everybody who's watching this movie or watching this interview, 
make sure you check it out when it comes out. Keep keep up to date in the closet corner. I will let you know the day it's released or the day when you have the premiere. Did you? Uh, I want to. I want to get into. Uh, well, first of all, let me ask you because you were talking about stunts. Was yep. anybody hurt during the filming with all these stunts that, going on? That's a great question. So I'm all about uh, safety. So. My stunt coordinator always has mats. I have, I own two mats, wrestling mats as well. Yeah. So anytime we, we do a rehearsal, we do it on the mat uh, to make sure we're safe. We want to get the motion right. Um, but no, thankfully no one's gotten, um, gotten hurt um, on set um, at all, um, which, which is good. Cause you know, we, we, we were really about um, safety. You know, we do have a personal liability insurance policy, you know, God forbid something happens, but uh, no, I mean, our, our safety personnel, uh, Lewis Kimball is another um, guy who's a stunt coordinator. Him and Sean are with me on, on on this one, and they do a real, real great, great job. I mean, we're there's so much stunts in in Holly Mass. I was just saying, I was talking about, you know, we had a lot of stunts over there too. Um, uh, the girl from Hawaii, Stacy, mm-hmm. we did a scene. You know, like those old um, wooden rafters in the houses that they're not really where the roof level. They're like right before the roof level. Yeah. Um, like a support beam, I guess you would call them. Yeah. So we had her, she jumped up there where Brad Ravenport was coming and she did, um, she put her legs around him. Like she's like, you know, I don't know, eight feet in the air wrapped around them and she flips him this way. So he goes flying the other way. He's a big guy. He's like two eighty, Right. So, I mean, yep. just getting that right. And, um, you know, this, just some of the stunts in this were all over the place. We had another uh, guy where Brad, a guy coming around the truck and he just like, leaps like right after him and he tackles them down and and just all kinds of stuff with breakable bottles um you know we um we were at um brown's harvest farm in windsor locks we were firing real um blank firing rounds there as well the mercenaries were firing um i think 308s and then the scene before that i talked about in woodbury we we're firing um you know blank firing ar-15 i mean real guns that were modified to shoot blanks in the middle of the night. So, you know, we got the real gunfire, the muzzle blasts, you know, we got real fighting. I mean, just, you know, Conor McGregor stuff, right? I mean, we're all over the place. We got the fighting, we got, we got the, you know, the suspense, the sci-fi, you know, everything's coming together really, really well. I know. Speaking of gunfire, I want your opinion on this because I'm sure you know what's going on with the movie Rust with Alec Baldwin. Of course, of course. What's your opinion on that? Because my opinion is even though Alec Baldwin is the producer, I don't think he should be arrested for that because he's an actor. He had somebody taking care of that. They were doing things, shooting off you know, shots without his knowledge. You know, he's an actor. He thought everything should be good. I mean, everyone's like, oh, you should have aimed the other way. But he's in the movie. He's acting. He's supposed to shoot that person. So he aims the gun at to make it look realistic. I really don't think he should be liable for anything. What's your opinion? Yeah, you know, it's a very debatable and opinionated topic. You know, first and foremost, the... Um... The uh, they call them um, um, like you know prop armorer or, or you know uh, weapon armorer, right? Their their responsibility is to, uh, of course, ensure the weapons are safe for the actors. And number one, there should have been no reason live ammunition was even there in the first place. Exactly. Now, at least the ammunition that that I work with, they're very easy to tell because if you have um, a blank firing um, bullet, it's kind of like pinched on the top. You could tell it's not real. Yeah. You know, where a real one would be, you know, like a regular, you know, looking bullet. This one is pinched. You could tell it's fake. But why they had real ammo mixed in with blanks is this. I have no idea how that would even happen because, first of all, it shouldn't have happened. And that's where the responsibility should should be on the prop, the prop armor to exactly. make sure everything's safe. And, and yeah, that's where it, the responsibility really lies. That's what, that's what I think, too. And I and I don't know why she is the one supposedly she was doing practice shots in the back with real bolts. I have no idea why she was doing that. And they, mm-hmm. she forgot to take the, one of the bolts out. She's the one that should be arrested for murder, if anything. He's an actor. I don't care if he's the producer or not. He had he hired somebody who knows what they supposedly knew their job, was supposed yep. to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. He had complete trust in them. I don't, and a lot of people, I think, more because they don't like Alec Baldwin because of you know the, what he does off off the screen. And I don't care, I care less what he does off the screen. I think on the screen, I personally don't think he should be liable. It's a it's a tragedy that did happen, and maybe there'll be a lot of different changes with movies, and they'll be a lot more careful. But I just I keep seeing all these different stories, like oh now he's indicted, no he's not indicted, now he's indicted again. <laughs> I just think that. The prop person, as you said, that's her responsibility. She should have checked it. She should have never had real live ammo anywhere near that gun. 
she's the one that should be going to jail if anything. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, that's what it really relies on is that that prop armor to make sure, yeah, you know, what's being uh, handled to the actor or given to the actor is safe. It's it's checked, it's secure, it's right, it's not in you know any danger, and and that obviously didn't happen. Yeah, I want to I want to go back to uh, your acting styles and how you deal with them because I interviewed Sarah uh, Victoria Price, who's Vincent Price's daughter. I'm sure you know who he is. Of course. Yeah. So <laughs> she was telling me that he, and there's a reason I'm bringing this up because you mentioned that you encouraged some of your actors do improv. She said when uh, her father worked with Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff, Peter Lorre loved to do improv. Then uh, Boris Karloff was such a, tr a trained actor. He goes, I do not want to do improv. I just want to read the script. I don't want anything. Vincent Price was more in the middle and he says he tried to talk Boris Karloff and do more improv. And so with you, have you ever had time where like, I want you to do this. And then the other actor who doesn't really, maybe he's not as good at improv said, I don't really know how to react to this because I can't think on, off the top of my head what to say in that moment. I'd rather just go by the script. Have you ever had to uh, work with different actors in different ways? Not really so much. I mean, um, they're pretty good at taking direction. I haven't really had a problem where, you know, they were afraid of improv or, yeah. you know, afraid to come up with anything. I mean, you know, we got really, really lucky, especially in the beginning. Actually, I should mention in the beginning of the film, um, this actually, you see my uh, virtual background, right? It's kind of yeah. like that stage. So that's actually in the film, too, is um, they're, the, they're interviewing uh, members of the U.S. military. Uh, Lori, who's from, I believe, New Jersey. Uh, Bill from Connecticut. Uh, one is like a lieutenant commander in the Navy. The other is like a U.S. Army or U.S. Air Force pilot. And the reason I bring it up is I told them they knew this when I was coming. I said, hey, all improv, what we're going to talk about is um, uh, we're going to talk about aircraft carrier. I said, hey, uh, Bill, um, you know, Area 51 is not in the desert. It's on an aircraft carrier. And that's what I had him run with. That. I said, you know, think about that, though. Who has access to go on an aircraft carrier? It's protected by the military. That's brilliant. They're going to experiment on aliens. What better way to do that? So I said, hey, that's the topic you're going to use. Run with it. So the talk show host was like interviewing them. So he was kind of going back. Yeah, you know, they're on the aircraft. And and then Lori was responding. Yeah, you know, this program has been going on for years. Um, UAPs, um, unidentified, you know, aerial phenomenon has been going on for a while. And um, experiment. I mean, they did just such a believable job like when you watch the beginning of the film of those two interviewing you're going to be like wow that that script is unbelievable but no that was the them just improv it wow. came out beautiful beautiful i love it so speaking of the story so this, this where did the story come from first of all i want to talk about that where did you get this idea well i mean uh for me i'm a big chris carter x-files guy right okay. so I, I love just the truth is out there right i mean that yeah you know that that slogan or motto i mean that's this right that's I mean, how how a simple but a better picture to describe, you know, these these agents, right? They work for the FBI and they're trying they the truth is out there. I mean, they're looking, you yeah. know, to find all these investigations that, you know, local authorities or they don't want anything to do with it. They're just way, way, you know, way up there on the, the crazy ladder. Yes. And, you know, I really love the series. I mean, um it, it was a long run for for um you know, David Duchovny and um, Julian uh, Anderson. Yep. Uh, it's Scully and Mulder. Right. And um, I just love that idea. And I always, I was a big fan of the sci-fi stuff. So I just wrote, uh, wrote this, this, this screenplay and uh, based on just my love for, you know, aliens and um, you know, I wanted to spin it more like the federal government or um, the U S government, you know, they're full deniable, you know, just, just tidy up loose ends and, and kill everyone. I don't even care if you work for me as a U.S. government. Kill them, too. Like, no loose ends. Like, that's how I came up with the story. And and the Article 92, I uh, wanted to kind of put, like, more of a military spin to it where, you know, think about all the people out there, real, real people, right, in, in, the, in the U.S. Army now, not just the Army, Marines, all of, all of them, right? Um, they're people, right? They're going to have a situation where their morale is going to be challenged. And that's what I wanted to put in there, that – these life decisions, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm I work for the U.S. Army. I want to follow orders, but you know, there's there's a part in in their 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 belief that if these orders are not lawful, they're unlawful. That that's a problem, you know. And uh, one of my favorite um, movies that kind of 
kind of dabbled a little bit into that. I don't know if you remember this movie, Rules of Engagement with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Tommy Lee Jones, kind of similar but different where Great movie. they're on top of the building, right? There, there's an order to kill. Well, there's civilians down there, right? Do we open fire? Well, I don't know. Maybe they're shooting at us, so let's open fire, right? So there's always going to be that decision check, and that's what I wanted to mix with kind of like a Chris Carter kind of story and then like that that morale check. Yeah, no, I love it. D- did a lot of this story come from your personal opinions on what's going on with UFOs? Um, A little bit, I would say. Yeah, like another film for me, I, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, D.B. Sweeney, Fire in the Sky, a brilliant, brilliant oh, yeah. UFO, right? So, I mean, I just watched this so much stuff, and, you know, I'm a big, big believer in that. And, um, you know, I wanted my kind of beliefs to kind of come out and uh, really um, show the audience, but not just aliens. Like, this film is more about that that um that morale check it's about making decisions it's about um you know doing the right thing and then of course the action the chasing of the people will they get away and then of course the twist at the end i'm not going to say what it is so mm-hmm. all these scenes are going to come 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 together really really good and that's what the really story i wanted to tell yep well it's funny when i growing up as I mentioned, one of my favorite movies still is Close Encounters. And I also love John yep. Carpenter's The Thing. Those two movies in the 80s, you know, 77 and then 82 is when The Thing came out. So that I love those movies. But my father was really into UFOs and he still is. But he would just drive us out into the middle of the night and just would sit there looking at the stars, waiting for UFOs to come. And so I was really into it. And I and whenever I tell somebody about UFOs and they're like, oh, there's, they're, they don't exist. If you think that out of this vast galaxy, we are the only human life form, you're, you're definitely being uh, <laughs> ignorant about it because there's, you can't say that out of all these planets, of this huge universe, we're it. There's definitely something out there. As, just like you said, the truth is out there, but Close Encounters also says we are not alone. Those two phrases right there pretty much sum up what I believe. And I think, right. a, yeah, absolutely right. And if I'm, I'm not really into big conspiracy theories, but I think that there's sometimes conspiracy theories come from something. And I can't remember his name. I can look it up on my phone while we're doing it. But there's a guy that supposedly worked for Area 51 and he told everybody what was going on. They made, basically made him disappear, made him obsolete. If you look him up, his name doesn't exist. You might know this story. I can't remember his name. Yeah, I, I do remember hearing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like I'm, I'm, I'm like I said I'm, I'm there might be a lot that he's lying about maybe just to get attention but maybe that came from somewhere because obviously the, we haven't seen anything and there's there's things that are out there and I mean when you have p- reputable people like fighter pilots and military people saying oh yeah I saw this or I saw that something was following my plane I don't know exactly what it was uh, those are those are people that aren't looking for 15 minutes of fame so th- I, I definitely believe there's something out there. Yeah, you know, you're right. And I actually saw some of these uh, interviews of like former employees from Area 51. I don't know if you heard this story, but what a lot of them would say, um, and they didn't really, you know, give away too many details or try to be that person, you know, like a snowed in to like, you know, like screw everyone in the runaway. Oh, but yeah. they would just say like something like, you know, hey, uh, you know, I worked there. And what they would do is they would go to this first location, they get on a plane and they would fly, they would fly in this, this plane to, the, to Area 51. That's how they would get there. They would never drive to Area 51. They would always go to this other location, mm-hmm. get in like a, um, a certain colored airplane that was colored a certain scheme, and they would actually fly from that parking lot to the to the real Area 51. Mm-hmm. That's how the employees would travel there. Yeah. My brother was a fire pilot, and I was an airline pilot. He said he – I don't think he was in there, if, but he's been over it, and he says, I just can't talk about it. I can't say anything. Mm-hmm. I don't need anything. Even either if he saw something or he can't or didn't say anything, he just can't really talk about it. And that means he's sworn in secrecy. So I would love to know if he if he was in there, if he did see anything. But I got to tell you a story. Years ago, I worked at this. Uh, I was a telemarketer, and there was a. She just left. I wish I had a chance to talk to her. But there's a story. And I, can, I think they made a movie out of this one too. They were on their way to Hamasa Beach. Supposedly they got picked up by a UFO, and but she worked at this place in Cheshire. This was in ninety eighty nine ninety. And she kept on saying the government had a chip in her. So everybody's like, oh, she's crazy. She's crazy. And my boss said, I don't know if she was crazy or not, but every time, every day at three o'clock, a black helicopter would fly over the building. The day she quit, the helicopter stopped flying over the building. (laughs) So you never know. You never know. You never know. That that's very, very true. So do you, I, I, I'm interested in this, your personal opinion on the different kinds of aliens. Do you believe there's, you know, we have obviously the grays. 
then mm-hmm. they also have the Swedes and you have the, uh, the, the reptilians. Do you believe in all the different types of aliens or do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I really do. You know, I think a lot of it too. Um, when I say a lot of it is, is how the humans perceive what aliens could look like, I think is a little bit skewed because you got all these people that claim things and they, they're just nuts, right? They didn't see anything, but they, yeah. they claim they seen something and then that 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 uh, whatever it was they saw, whether, you know, big head, green eyes, that kind of just stuck yeah. with uh, the generation of, well, this is what aliens could look like. Um, I was a big um, and still am um, Star Trek Next Generation, right? You got oh, yeah. Cleons, right? All the different types, right, that they portray in their series. And I think it's definitely uh, plausible and believable that, you know, as you go to these different planets that, you know, there's definitely definitely different creatures out there. I mean. Look at out of all the the life we have here, we you know, insects, animals, oh, yeah, exactly. humans, right? There's all different species, and I think out there, you know, on these multiple different planets, where you know some plants are, you know, like I don't know, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, they can melt your skin off. But there's some type of species that lives there, right? Other planets are kind of similar to Earth, and some of them have acid rain. I mean, there's all these different types of uh, weather and anomalies, and um, what can live out there, and we just can't go there because obviously we don't have the technology or the um, the the safety vessels to go and explore these planets. But there, there's definitely different different types out there. I, I really do believe that. Do you believe that we they have bases underneath underground on Earth? Because that's another theory um, that some of the some people say that the aliens have they're living underground and they have bases. It's uh, I was just curious. I mean, your you know what? You never that. you never know. I mean, look yeah. at the. Um, what they did with the movie with Charlie Sheen, the arrival, right? These, oh, yeah. these people and, you know, they look like humans. They, they're not really human and they're just kind of, you know, spying on us. Who knows? Maybe that's even happening, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, you never know. You never know. I know. Exactly. I mean, no, nobody will ever really know. It's almost like death when people say, well, we're religion. It's like, we're all agnostic. We really <laughs> don't know what's out there until we die. So it's similar to like we've, I mean, most, for most of us, we haven't seen an alien. So we really don't know. I, I definitely believe there's something out there, as you said, there's no way that we are it, but it, I just, I've never seen one. So we don't really know what they look like. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure you heard of the Betty and Barney Hill story. The, yes. So, uh, and this, this, this story intrigues me. This was back, I want to say in the sixties. Cause I, I'm so mad. I was supposed to interview Betty, Betty Hill's niece, but she had long COVID and she kept canceling and for, we never had a chance to reschedule, but I wanted to talk to her. But what, why I'm bringing this up was like, it's so interesting because under hypnosis, she drew a map of where she was and they're like, that doesn't exist. There's no way that's not true. And then it wasn't until years later when we had the technology and they're like, oh, that's what Betty was talking about. And then then <laughs> they realized that, that there is actually a, a planet out there that is where she said it is, but it wasn't until years later when they, but she drew it under hypnosis. So. So how would yeah. she know that if uh, if she was just making it up? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So, would it, can I? I know you're not. You don't want to give anything away. But is this a good alien or bad alien movie? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so the alien is uh, more or less a focal point. I mean, in the film, we only see him a couple times because when he's in the roadway, he's like already dead at yeah. that point, right? So. Uh, so we see him when the U.S. military has him. And what's funny is there's this crazy, crazy scientist played by Jeff Rosman. Um, his name is Harold. And he he really just like, you know, it's his baby. Right. So like when the U.S. government brought the alien in the next room, they're kind of having this, this secret meeting about Dan Ravenport, you know, at, you know, 1600 hours, you know, he encountered the alien. So Harold storms in the meeting of, uh, you know, like the secretary of defense is in there, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, CIA director, all these big, big wigs, right? Talking about Dan Ravenport. Harold goes, where is he? Where is he? Starts throwing newspapers at him. Where is, where's the alien? Like he wants to see him. Like, yeah. you know, so it's just funny. And um, he goes in and sees him. He starts examining him and, you know, like looking at it, you know, so they have this cool moment where they're examining the alien. So we see that. And there's a couple of funny scenes where let's just say Harold is just doing some funny things with the alien. You know, he's got that, that kind of like um, unique, um, a mindset you know so like it's his baby you know so there are funny moments with that but throughout the movie we see the alien i think only maybe i don't know four or five times it's just more of the focal point of um why dan ravenport's in so much trouble but there are funny moments with harold and, and the alien now when you you wrote the movie as i mentioned before you wrote the screenplay 
did you write a lot of, did you put a lot of the humor into it or did the humor sort of develop as the actor started improving? No, I mean, um, pretty much all of the, the humor was, was in there already. I added all that in already. Cause I think it's, um, you know, obviously it's not a comedy, but I want some things, you know, obviously there's some serious moments, you know, about like the U S president, uh, very powerful lines, but there's, there's going to be a couple, you know, funny moments in the film. You know, I always want to have that, that, uh, you know, laugh, especially going to the movie theater, you know, you don't want to fall asleep or right. You want to have that laugh or, or that moment. Right. That's what we look for. Like, you know, for example, I just on Friday, I don't know if you saw it, but I just saw Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, the new one. I didn't see it yet. How was it? It was good. The reason I bring it up, there's one scene in there. Like, again, it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's a movie. It's not a comedy or anything, but, you know, they, they do have these moments. Right. So there's a funny part. I'm not going to ruin it for you, but there's a funny part. On, on um, I'll just say there's a fire master and, you know, like the key master was in the original, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. There's something that somebody called the fire master in the new one. And he goes down a flagpole a certain way when this guy that, that looks like Vecca from stranger things is there. And yeah. it was just that moment, like you would just you'd laugh about it, you know? So you got to have that, that laughing moment in, in the, in the film too, you know? Oh, no, I agree with you. I, I love it when movies inject humor into a drama, drama, like even horror movies, like evil dead is still one of my all time favorite horror yeah. movies. I just Evil Dead Part Two, especially because it's there's a lot of slapstick, but it's a horror movie. It's funny, it's scary, and I and I love the same thing. And that's why I wanted to bring that up because you have done so many different types of genres of movies. Mm-hmm. Is there, uh, what's your favorite? First of all, to uh, write, direct, produce. What's your favorite genre? Do you have one? Yeah, you know they're they're all fun. I've done psychological thrillers. I've done psychological horrors. I've done. Um, wow kind of like mafia crime yeah and the new one's more like you know sci-fi action thriller drama it's got all a little bit of comedy you know i i think that they're all special t- to themselves like mm-hmm. you know they really they really stand alone it's just when you write like they really come come out in their own their way like for example the funny one we were talking about before about the the holocaust movie where they they didn't you know they didn't know if it was real right so I did write something um, that's out now called the Harvard Psychologist and we filmed a lot of it in Woolkit, Connecticut where yeah. it's uh, he's a Harvard psychologist he's smart but he moonlights as a serial killer because he's smart and he can do that right so what's funny about it is um, one of my favorite ones that I wrote is that he basically he he puts a wig on he becomes um, Edward Atkins Tommy Fury played him by the way and Edward Atkins basically goes and he pretends he's a uh, a film director. So he goes to this guy's house, um, Corey. He's actually an actor. So it's an actor playing an actor. Go, go yeah. figure. So he knocks on. He's like, I saw you in, in this film. Your work was just amazing. I need you in this role. And he's like, well, let me think about it. It's like, you don't understand. I wrote this role for you. So he's reading it. He's actually got the screenplay. You know, we're filming it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So he reports to the set the next day. And what's funny about this is – um. This guy, Corey, he really thinks this guy's a film director, not a serial killer. But what happens is that he gives him a murder weapon and he he tells him on, on camera to read this, you know, his confession. I killed Claire Foster. That B had it come in. You know, I, I buried her body and blah, blah, blah. So he has the murder weapons, his fingerprints. And then he tells him the next day we're going to film this at the police the st- police department. You're going to go ahead and see this guy. He, he's expecting me. So what he doesn't know is that Edward Atkins, a.k.a. Um, uh, Tommy Fury, he played um, Henry Millard. He actually mailed that confession tape to the police department. He's the one that actually killed the real person, but guess whose fingerprints was on it? So he, he thinks he he actually mailed the police department an envelope with that guy's confession I when he it. filmed saying he clear. So the police think he's there to confess. He's like, no, I'm here for a film set. And the guy, th- they think he's messing with them. So he gets blamed for it. So just the writing range, you can go with these things. This is unbelievable, you know? I can imagine. And I think on that one, I got like best um, horror, like best surprise or something. Like I, I won in like a uh, a film festival uh, award for that one. Wow. Congratulations on that. Yeah, that was a real fun one. Has there been a genre that you have not tackled yet and won't? <laughs> well, that that's another good one. Um, well, um, you know, I'm a big, um, you know, John Hughes. And you know, oh, yeah. so I, I, I um, eventually want to do like an all out just comedy yeah. um that's on um on uh my list and, and another one that i may do i 
I say may do because it's really hard to do it because, you know, it's, it's got such a quite big following. Um, Back to the Future fan film. The problem with that, you know, yeah. Michael J. Fox right now, you'd have to spin it in a, in a different way. Yeah. And, you know, one of my favorite films. And, you know, it just amazes me where executives can kind of, uh, I don't know if you heard this story, but um, one of the executives um, sent a letter to Steven Spielberg and um, Zemeckis. And he said, hey, you know, I really love this, um, but we, we don't like the title. Why don't we make it Spaceman from Pluto? That's what they oh really wanted God. to call it. So they're oh strong arming them to change the film from Back to the Future to um, Spaceman from Pluto. And, you know, the reason I bring that up is, you know, trust your gut. Don't let them don't let them, you know, change your 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 mind on things. And to this day, it is still Back to the Future. So I'm glad they didn't listen to uh, that that executive and change it from Back to the Future to Spaceman um, from Pluto. That's wow. ridiculous, right? Yeah, well, I gotta tell you a funny story about that because I'm sure you know who William Friedkin is. He directed The Exorcist and so many other movies. But on The Exorcist, I read his uh, autobiography, and he said that he goes, "These studio heads, all they want to do is hear themselves talk. They really have no idea what you're talking about." They said he showed them the movie. They're like, "Oh, you got to cut this. You got to cut that." He said, "This movie is perfect." He goes, "You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just not do anything. I'm gonna wait a month, and I'm gonna say I made all the cuts you want me to make, and I'm gonna show it to them." So they're like, "No way, they're gonna know." He goes, "No, watch this." He, they, he waited about a month, month and a half, showed him the movie, didn't make one cut. And the studio head goes, see, I told you, see, it's much better now. All those cuts I told you to make, see, <laughs> if you listen to me, you know what you're doing. So they, they <laughs> goes, I didn't make one cut. All they like doing is like, I'm in charge. I want to say something that sounds important, but they really have no clue. They should just let the filmmaker be the filmmaker. And that's what kills me. And I don't know if you have to deal with this because when you put your uh, blood, sweat and tears into a movie, you're working years on a movie, and then they have these uh, preview audiences. So 30 people say, I don't like this. Take that part out. It's like, what? This is my movie and you you just watched it for two hours. I worked three years on it. And you're telling me you don't like it. And then the, the studio say, yeah, well, this preview audience said, nah, let's, let's change it. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head is um, there was a film that recently was uh, released and it kind of ran into a similar thing. It was in... Um, post-production i think for two or three years if you look at it the imdb trivia um and that's the um the adam sandler um space movie with the uh with spaceman i think it's called okay. on netflix if you haven't seen it um there's like a talking spider and, and then just kind of a psychological movie but the same thing is when they release this um it went to like a, a beta audience and it got really mixed reviews. So they were they kind of had it in post-production, they were gonna make some subtle changes because they were afraid of which way you know this would be perceived as same thing. They had that problem as well. Yeah. So for you, since you're an independent company, you really don't have to deal with it. You you it's your vision and you can put it out however you want. Right? Nobody's telling that, you yeah. what to do. I love that. that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, and um you know, as far as uh, back to your question, you said uh, before was, um, you know, what what type of films you might be afraid to make? I think eventually and I'm not saying tomorrow or, you know, a year from now or two years from now, but, you know, you always got to challenge yourself. Like for me, like like musicals. Right. Yeah. You know, that's something I, I want to say I care for. I'm not jumping up and down to, you know, to see something. But I think for that reason, I, I might dabble into something like that just to challenge yourself to say, hey. I can eat, I can make one right you know so that might be something yeah you know I there's there's a horror musical I well I want to look this up because it's hilarious. it's got uh who's who's the guy who played in Goodfellas uh, he his so Paul Servino's in it and the oh, okay. he's okay. in it really it, yeah I got I'm gonna look this this one I want to find out because it's it's a great but it's a it's a, an opera it's a let's see I I wish I I it, the reason I can't remember is I haven't thought about this movie in song. I I saw it years ago, and but in, it's something that you would never think that these people would be in it, or the people that direct you know wrote and directed it, whatever. A oh, repo, the genetic opera. Check it oh, out. Really? But okay. It, it's a it's a horror opera, so it can be done. And you have that sen same sensibility where you can make it your own, but make it fun, and it could be a musical or slash opera. I I, I would like to see that. Oh yeah. Yeah. You got to just go outside your comfort level sometimes. And just that, that's what's really going to make you, uh, yep. you know, stand out. Same thing like with an actor, right? You don't want to be typecasted as a, oh, yeah. a policeman or a detective or whatever. You got to take different roles. You got to really, you can't be typecasted or otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to just do the same, 
same roles over and over and over and again. You're going to miss the opportunity and your range and all that. You're not going to you're not going to be able to you know even go anywhere if you don't do that. Yeah, that's why. Like for right now, I think some of the greatest actors to me, like Christian Bale, Sam Rockwell. Uh, who, I'm trying to think of the the woman's name, but she she is really these because they play so many different like Johnny Depp in his Haiti. He would play these really out like you play Hunter Thompson one time, and then he'd do Pirates of the Caribbean. So he would just do an independent movie that nobody would really watch, but then he'd do a big feature. They do yep. movies with Kevin Smith. So I, I like that. Like he showed his range and he did so many different types of movies. And I, I agree because like if you just keep playing the same role over and over again, it's all you're ever going to get hired for, and nobody's ever going to see you as anything else than that. Yeah. Have you ever done a rom com? <laughs> you know, it's uh, funny how you mentioned that. Uh, I, I got that idea floating. A couple other people mentioned that I should do one. Um, not not saying it's you know my favorite. I could dabble into, but I definitely could probably pull that off. I think. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, that's something I may consider. Well, the the good thing is, it seems like you never run out of ideas. You no, always you always no. have something. Like right now, you already mentioned like some of the things that you're with the next movie you're going to be working on. Do you already know, have an idea what you're going to be working on after that? Are you that far ahead? Um, A little bit. I mean, some of these ideas come from uh, dreams I've had and I've kind of uh, worked on characters and backstory. I just haven't had much dreams lately. I think when your mind is so focused and occupied on what you're doing, especially a film this large and this scale, I, I think your mind is in a place where it doesn't wander too much. But when you have those opportunities where you're done filming and you're kind of, your mind is just kind of open, then I'll start dreaming and coming up with other ideas. But I have a lot of scripts that are just kind of like parked in my brain right now that I'll get to. But right now where my focus is, is just, just finishing this, this, this uh, film is top priority over everything else right now. And it's um, almost done. So I'm really thankful for that. And then once that's done, I'm sure I'll shift focus over to something else. Well, so I saw a documentary on Woody Allen and they, they asked him, they said, do you ever run an idea? So he opened up his drawer. He goes, look at this. And there was just paper <laughs> and paper and paper. And it had two or three sentences and it was just different ideas. He goes, I write an idea down and throw it in there. Maybe a couple of years later, I'll say, oh, I forgot about this. Let me write something on this. So he goes, I'll never, ever run out of an idea. So it sounds like something similar with you. You'll have a dream or a thought. Yeah. Let me write this down. Let me put it to the side and I'll get back to it later. And I love that. Absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, uh, there might be, you know, time like late at night, I'll have an idea or a dream. I'll just email myself, remember this, remember that. And then I'll build off of that. Like whether it's six months later, two years, three years, I have it. And then maybe I'll materialize into something. Now, is this a full-time job for you now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically it really is. I mean, um, you know, I do um, other things as well, like, um, you know, clients, filming clients, uh, corporate clients, I'll do videos for, um, not like my own work, but like if they need like, um, you know, like a um, uh, internal video of like manufacturing, you know, I'll, re I'll record that for them. So different various clients in different vari varying industries. Uh, but still, I'm film at least I'm filming something. But um, oh, yeah. when I'm not doing that, then I'm focused on um, doing my own work, which is Hawk Studios, uh, thehawkstudios.com. That, that'll explain more of what we do out there as well. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. How long ago did you form that? Yeah, so interesting story was uh, we were prior to Hawk Studios were McGee Productions, and I actually formed Hawk Studios um, sometime in uh, I think December, uh, sometime in December um, a year or two ago. My oh. father passed away July eighth, twenty twenty two, I believe. So yeah, about two years ago. And what happened was is um. You know, we had Tony Tony Martone premiere was July 8th and my father was at home. He didn't make it. He, he can't really walk too well. Um, he actually literally um, during the premiere around the same time, eight, nine o'clock, he, he passed away. And um, what's interesting about that is um, in December, I've never seen a hawk this close before. And, and generally in, my, in, my, in where I live at a tree branch about five feet in the air, this hawk was just a well, first I left. It was like five in the morning. I forgot my cell phone. So I drove back home. And then when I when I got back home and I left again, I looked and I see this creature and I thought it was an owl at first. And I walked up to it. It's like five feet on a branch like this. And it was a hawk just attentively looking at me. I went to get closer, look at it, and it kind of just flew away like really slow. Yep. I didn't think of anything. But then what was weird about that was my father, like, you know, he does music, composing. Yeah. He wrote a song 
uh, five years ago, I think back in 2017, called Rise. And on the album cover was a bird, a hawk. It looked like a hawk. And um, the lyrics were just so haunting. It was almost like a premonition. So his lyrics talk about rising from the ashes, soaring high in the sky. So it was just very, maybe it's a spiritual animal that visited me. So I was like, this is dad. Like, this is, this is crazy. Like I was like getting like, you know, the hairs are coming up off your, your yeah. skin, like, and, you know, rising up from the ashes, soaring high in the skies, you know, um, and, and uh, that's our official song and our official motto is rise up after my dad. So I rebranded McGee productions in the Hawk studios after my dad, just in that moment. And then around Christmas time, uh, Hawk in uh, my backyard, when we were filming in, um, Waterbury, another hawk was just just circling around our film set, just watching on the tree branch, making noise. And then we all looked up. And then uh, Mauricio, uh, who knows the story, he plays um, Ghost in my film. He goes, that's Mr. McGee up there. And I'm like, yep, you are right. I mean, he's there. He's watching. So we re we actually rebranded the whole thing from, uh, from that to Hawk Studios in wow. his honor. Yeah. Wow. I, I love that. It's a great name. It has a great meaning behind it. Great it story does, behind yes. it. Last time you were on the show, we were talking about some of your influences. And I remember when you and I were talking about you love Tarantino's writing. And we brought up True Romance. And you said you love the scene oh, with yeah. Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken and the eggplant. Yep. So for you, it, it, he's one of your, I'm guessing, still one of your current favorites for writing and directing. Do you, who, who are some of your other biggest biggest influences right now, currently? Yeah, I mean, still from before, I would say David Lynch is way up there as oh, well. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, all of uh, Lost Highway is a very rare I love underrated that film where, um, what's yeah. his name? Um, well, Robert Blake. Got Robert Bill Blake, Pullman. before he, he got arrested, was in that film. Yep. Um, and I think Bill Pullman, Pullman. is in it. Bill yep. Pullman, Robert Blake, Henry Rollins, Marilyn Manson. That's yeah, a great movie. Yeah, Marilyn Manson, I Put a Spell on You, is in the soundtrack. And, uh, you know, so him... Um, Del Toro, of course, yep. the Spanish director, Pan's Labyrinth, um, Devil's Backbone, um, David Cronenberg yeah. um, is up there. Existence, I think, Video Videodrome, maybe I think. Yeah, he did. Videodrome, Scanners, yep. so many oh, yeah. great movies. Yeah. So I mean, all Why? over, just very indifferent people. Brian De Palma, Tony right. Scott, of course, that goes back to True Romance, and yeah. I think Top Gun, and you know, uh, Last Boy Scout. I think he did all those. Yeah, he did. You know, and uh, yeah, so th those are probably i think my biggest ones yeah what, what about growing up were those some of the people because you were i'm not sure of your age but were those people that yeah. you growing up were watching like because for me like i like i mean i grew up with actually some of the similar like i grew up with uh spielberg scorsese de palma like a lot of this, and uh like for like when i was a kid my brothers and i used to make movies for the for the neighborhood kids and we'd we'd we wouldn't film it. We didn't have cameras back in the seventies like that, but we would just do live action, charge the kids a quarter and act it out. We had great movies like killer grass and shark and UFO. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess we didn't know what the word plagiarism meant back then, but when close encounters came out, I wrote this great story called UFO. When Jaws came out, my brother wrote this great book called shark. We built a wooden shark. We had a pond. It was so funny, but so yeah. So growing up, I loved all that. And for, for uh, writing is it, would, would you say Tarantino is one of the best out there right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really do. I think, um, you know, of course, um, growing up too, um, uh, which you just asked me, I think John Hughes was definitely a big, Oh yeah. I mean, he was just so big in the eighties and the early nineties and you know, all that. And, uh, what I like about him is his movies are hilarious. There there's dramatic moments, but it has a lot of heart. Like all it does. Movies, it like, does. Like my favorite vacation movie is Christmas vacation. That was the one he did. And of course I've seen the home alone movies, breakfast, of course. all those movies. Yeah. So I, there's not really a bad, like, as you mentioned, there's not a bad one in the bunch that I can think of. That he did. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he, that's, I mean, you know, that one day I want to dabble in the comedy to have, um, you know, that under my resume, but yeah. you know, I would really like watching a lot of those and, course the teenage mutant ninja turtles although I, I can't remember who directed that one uh, yeah, off the sure top either. of my head but um you know movies like that um you know really resident to um that times and it's a lot of fun movies back then too i would watch like <laughs> one of my favorite is the monster squad right oh yeah remember that one and uh uh like uh what's the out of the one um license to drive the two Corys. you remember that one yep oh yeah Corey yeah Feldman and this and is so much fun yeah. I mean, back then, you know, it's, it's like explorers, right? They they flow like the amusement 
cart rides and yeah um just so much different type of film back then you oh know? my god well, yeah i think that it's unfortunately becoming more and more politically correct so their movies back then had i think a lot more freedom where you could do different yeah. things without people about worrying about offending somebody or which to me i always say if you don't want to see it don't go it's nobody's putting a gun to your head and saying you have to see this movie don't go there and make a big stink about it and start boycotting things if you don't like it don't go like perfect example is dogma i la- i love that movie by kevin smith and when I went oh, yeah. there, there was one person in the Waterbury uh, Mall just boycotting it. I said, this is hilarious. And, it's no, and the, the movie, if they watch it, it, actually made a lot of sense. I don't know what was so offensive about it. It was just, it was just talking about religion and different beliefs of what people believe in. But it's just, I think that back then, people weren't as uptight as they are now. Even like the MPAA, I think they've just gotten so much. Like an example, yeah. would be Jaws was PG. There's no way that would be PG now. That would be rated R without a doubt. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, everything is, is changed. And I think a lot of it too is, um, you know, America in general, there's always been, been soft, but we're getting much softer. Like, look, yes. like maybe, I don't know, even like, um, five, 10 years ago. I mean, just the different varying commercials of what's, um, offensive, what's not offensive. I don't know if you remember this commercial, but I think this was out maybe 10, 15 years ago. Remember, um, I think the, uh, in your car, you know how you have your radios. I think it's uh, blank, blank plot. I think it's a German uh, manufacturer. You know, like how you have your pioneers or whatever. This was called blank put. I think it's like a, I don't know if I'm, I want to say German, but they had a commercial where the guy was in the car. He turned up the radio. You know, like the bass in the back, it would make you know things yeah. move. You know, right? So they had these two stuffed animals on the back of like the where the speakers are in the back near the the um, back window. And as the mo- the um, music would move, it would push them closer, like they're they're going like yeah. this, like you know, doing things, right? So, but you know, if we did that in America, like they would be like totally offensive with it, and you know, yeah. and there's another one they did. Um, it was a Toyota commercial. They showed this maybe five, ten years ago, where um, it was a, a husband and a wife, and this was uh, allowed in international, but not allowed over here. They were like fighting over the car keys. They would like just beat the crap. Like she would throw like a like a um, an iron at his head and they were just like fighting and your hair catches on fire. So they blow up the house, like over the car keys. And he's like, you know, he won. And then she got him back, like, like almost murdered him over the car. And they're like, there's some slogan. They're like, you know, you know, Toyota, you know, I don't know what the slogan was like, you know, um, for couples too, or something. Yeah. I don't know. It was like, is this, you so know, you can't get away with that over time. here. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, it's funny. Cause I, I, I talked about this to other people. You, you and I might have talked about it. Let's do it again because I it's a, you brought up a great point. I love foreign movies, and I think that they have so much more freedom over yes. there, like you're saying. And I'll give you an example. And they're not afraid to end the movie on a on a, a like real, realistic note. There's a movie I think it's called The Vanishing or Vanishing. The, the American version starred um, Kiefer Sutherland, where he's looking for his wife, and then he finally finds her in the trunk, and he she's alive, and he lets her out. And, I have to look up. I think it's called The Vanishing. But in the original version, which yeah. is a foreign movie, he finds her. She's in the trunk, but she's dead, and the movie ends. That's realistic. That's what really should happen. <laughs> and that's why I think that um, you, uh, with uh, Quentin Tarantino, he grew up on all those movies at Video Archives working with Roger Avery, and he saw these movies. And with True Romance, he wanted Christian Slater's character to die. So when he gets shot in the eye, he said, mm-hmm. there's no way he's going to survive that. And the studio said, there's no way people are going to go crazy. So they had Roger Avery come in and rewrite the ending. So he lived. It's just that I think that American audiences want everything all wrapped up nicely where they walk away <laughs> happily into the sunset. And a perfect example is, did you ever see Stephen King's The Mist? I have. It's been a while, though. It's been all a while, right. but well, I, have, I have seen it. I'll refresh your memory because I went into this. I, I saw the movie. I was buying tickets. I hear people going, what the fuck? I can't fucking believe it. So what is going on? <laughs> So I go see the movie at the end, and if people don't know what the movie is, I'm, it came out over 20 years ago, so I'm not really, it's no spoiler alerts. <clears throat> the, there's a, a mist that's over this town, and there's, these monsters come out of the mist. So he's take, the, the, the car breaks down. So the father, to save his kids, he kills his two kids, kills the babysitter, he tries to kill himself, puts the gun to his head, he runs out of bullets, and he goes, oh shit, the monsters are coming. 
stops at his car. It's the government. The government's like, just want to say everything's all set. The monsters are all dead. And he's like, no, that's the end of the movie. <laughs> I, the, but people were freaking out. I just don't know why. It's like, I think that was such, such a, but even Stephen King goes, that was even too dark for me. I thought it was great. I loved it. <laughs> but the, I love the European and Italian horror movies like uh, Dario Argento, Lucio Fulci. And you should see, I don't know if you like them, but they get away with it everything and anything the the amount of gore and not every movie has to have a lot of gore to make it a good no. movie, but they just have a lot more freedom where they can show scenes like what the hell was this yeah you know a lot not just italian and um yeah. french but uh takashi mikey is a japanese film director deadly outlaw reke oh. and uh itchy the killer i mean just oh yeah very gory 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 stuff yeah. you know I, I i did forget i did see that one that was a great movie yeah there's another movie. I can't remember. She, she was really good. I have to look. I think you, know, you and I might have discussed this before, but it's a movie where this girl gets pregnant by a car. It's a French movie. So then I went back and I looked up the director and she wrote a movie called Raw where this kid's a vegan and they feed him meat and he turns into his killer. It's really good. I have to, it's, I saw it in the theaters. It was, it was right around COVID time because at COVID there wasn't a lot of movies coming out. So they were showing foreign movies and independent movies. I loved it. That was, to me, that was some of the better years for movie in the theaters. I'm going to look yeah, at I mean, you know, yeah, there is just so much, you know, like oh, out of this world. Like there's another one. Uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's Tak Takashi Mikey or not, but Gozu, uh, G-O-Z-U, I think, or yeah, G G G O G U Z O something that's called Gozu. Um, just really freaky stuff. Like at the end, uh, we're talking about someone getting re reincarnated, rebirth. Like they literally show like coming out, like, you know, like just crazy stuff. Like in this film, like they get away with so much, so much stuff, you know? Uh, oh, Titani. I think it's pronounced T I T A N E. It came out in 2021. It's the uh, yeah, freakiest I think, movie. I think I wanted to say, I think I had that on my list. I don't think I've watched that one yet. It's one of those movies where I'm watching. I'm like, do I like this? I can't stop looking away. It's it, it, it. I loved it. Like it's 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 one of those movies. Like what the hell is going on? I have to find out what happens. It's just. But yeah, there's they could just never do movies like that over here. I don't think. No, it's no, just, they can't. And like when I was talking about some of the, I can't remember which one it was. Um, one of the Japanese movies, uh, Takashi Mikey, but yeah, I don't know if it's Deadly Outlaw Rekka or or one of the other ones. But um, you know, one of the game leaders, he has this um or somebody's walking a dog or he has a dog and he starts this, it's on the leash. He just goes like this and he's whacking the window with a dog with a leash like this. And you see the dog, boom, 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 hitting the window, you know, and like just stuff like that. You're like, you know, what the heck is going on? Like, Oh yeah. Well, you know, what's funny. And I, I've actually saw this happen where <laughs> this movie where my mother was watching and person after person was getting killed. She didn't say a word. They screw a dog over the bridge. What the fuck? I said, what are you talking about? They just killed four people. You're worried about a dog. You got thrown. But yeah, so any kind of animal cruelty. Oh, yeah. Even if it's not real. People well, yeah, unless mind. it's um, a USA yeah. film. They try to make it funny. Remember, uh, what was it? Was it Jack Black? Where he kicked the dog off the bridge of the burrito or whatever, whatever that was? Uh, that's, Nacho wait, Libra? That's funny. That's the movie I'm talking about. I oh, I that's know, the one. That might have been what. That's the one she saw. I saw the dog get kicked off the bridge. My mother freaked out. Yeah, but... that's the um Jack Black. I think that's uh, Nacho Li Libra or whatever. Yeah, that, that might be it. That might be I it. Think, I think that's the one where he just like yeah. he gets. I think he gets a. Uh, he's on a motorcycle. I think and a car cuts him off, and then yeah. the dog's barking. And he just like punts him off. Punts the dog off the bridge. That, I think. I think it's that one. I think that, so. That might be the one because we were watching because I was my parents live in the Cape and then we'll watch a lot of movies while we're up there. And I think we were watching like another one where they're getting. But that was the one was Jack Black. Yeah, I, Jack Black. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. So it's just, uh, uh, I, for you, okay, let's talk about this. One of my favorite current directors is uh, Chris Nolan. What's your opinion on him? Uh, no, remind me what, what, uh, well, he what just film? came out with Oppenheimer. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, I haven't seen that one yet. Is I mean, what, what other work has he done other than that? Oh, he, he did, uh, what's the, he did the Batman movies with Chris, with uh, Christian Bale, all the three Batmans. Oh, okay. Okay. He did, uh, What's the movie with the dreams? It's a, with with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Michael Caine. That's a great movie. The but dreams. There's, it's all about dreams where they can they can uh, go into their dreams and they start changing. I'll tell you in a second. Like Chris Nolan, because uh, but he, he is to me like one of the best. And then he did Memento. Memento is another one. If you saw that. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, Memento. Yeah, I have that on DVD actually. Memento. Yeah. Then the, he used to, he did another one called The Following, which was before that was like one of his older movies. But like his current ones are, uh, 
following Insomnia, Dark Knight. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Prestige, Inception. That's the movie. Inception, Dunkirk he did. Um, okay. Oppenheimer. Okay. And so for me, I, I saw Oppenheimer three times. Only, only first time I wanted to see it on my own. And then my wife wanted to see it, so I saw it with her. Then I went to Cape Cod. My brother wanted to see it, so I saw it a third time. I actually <laughs> thought that um, he did a phenomenal job with the movie. It's all about the making of the atomic bomb. I, I thought out of all the movies that were up for Oscars this year, that deserved it out of the ones that were the other ones that were in the category. So it's like for you, to, like I, I have it written down because I wanted to uh, talk about this. There was Oppenheimer, American Fiction, which I didn't see, Anatomy of a Fall. That was a great movie. I want to say it was British, but it was a... Uh, this woman is accused of her her husband, who they she was she was in a big fight with. He falls while uh, fixing that uh, fixing the roof, and throughout the whole movie, she's on trial trying to find out if she pushed him or if he fell. And what I love about that movie because it's a foreign movie as well. It ended on a cliffhanger. You don't know what happened or yep. if he did do yep. it. So I love that. Um, Barbie. I thought Barbie was fun. That was another one's up front. I don't think it really should have won Best Picture, but I don't really think it should have been like it, it, to me. It wasn't as woke as everybody made it seem it seemed to be. I'm not sure if you saw it. I thought it was no, just a, it's a fun that, movie yeah, about no. dolls. It's like it's a Ken doll and a Barbie doll, <laughs> and basically like, he wants respect. He didn't get it in the Barbie world. Then he goes to the real world, and they're like, "Oh, people are listening to me." So he takes it over to the Barbie world. It's just it's a fun, stupid movie. I don't think that it should have been up for Oscar, but. I really don't think that people were freaking out over saying, oh, my God, it was so woke and this and that. It's 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 Mattel. It's it's Kendall. It's a Barbie doll. <laughs> and then Martin Scorsese, the other one I thought was a great movie was Killers of the Flower Moon. Did you see that? You know, that um, I think that's on Apple TV now. I haven't checked it out yet. That Leonardo DiCaprio's in it, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's on my list. Robert I haven't seen it. It's a it definitely going to check that out, though. It's, it's, I want to say it's almost four hours long, but it doesn't seem like, you know, some movies where you're going, oh, looking at your watch, looking at your phone. <laughs> this yep. movie, I, it kept my attention the whole time. I was not bored. I didn't want to go to the bathroom because I couldn't. I wanted to see what was going to happen next. It just kept my interest. And then I want your opinion on this because another movie that was up for Oscar, which I liked. I don't really think it should have won, but was Maestro. Bradley Cooper, he played uh, Leonard Bernstein. Yep, I heard. I have not seen that, so I can't really comment on that. But um, I don't hear. Well, here's why. And Steven Spielberg made a great point about this. The movie yeah. was on Netflix, and it maybe played in the theater for a weekend. And they and he said he goes, "It's a made-for-TV movie. Movies that are up for Oscars should be theatrical versions. It should, like they should have a different category for the yeah. streaming services." And I know it's a different world now, and everything goes right to stream. But I don't think movie. I, I agree with Spielberg. Of, it's basically a made for TV movie and he did do a good job. I just don't think that, I think the movie to me was a little too convoluted. It was all over the place. I really wasn't sure what was going on. It would go from one scene to another without any explanation. So past lives was another one. I didn't see that. My wife saw it. She said she, it was pretty good. Poor things was another one. She, uh, Emily Blunt won best uh, actress for that. Sort of like a Frankenstein type movie with, mm. uh, I want to say is it Willem Dafoe or Christopher Walken, one of them. Okay. And then the zone of interest where the, it's, it's something about Nazis. I didn't see that one either, but yeah, me either. Yeah. So for out of all of them, I think the Oppenheimer definitely deserved best pictures. That's another one. It's like over three hours long, but it kept my interest. It was interesting. And I saw several documentaries on it and it was fairly accurate. Yeah. That's where you, what you really want is to have them do, uh, you know, do, do the um, justice of uh, really making it as, historical uh, accurate as possible and uh, yeah that's on my list as well but you know with, with my filming uh, there's so many movies i've missed just because i just been oh, yeah. focused on you know on the film and just going and filming and just getting this this thing done i like i'm so like you know behind you know i did uh treat myself to ghostbusters though friday the new one at the theater but um i haven't really been uh tuning in to, to too much stuff lately though well that that's a good question for you because when I was writing books, I would, and I interviewed different authors too, and every author said to be the best writer, you should read as much as you can and as many different in different types of genres. So, for you as a filmmaker, do you think that you get more inspiration from watching so many different movies, so many different types of movies, or is it just that you you basically know what you want, you have a vision, and you don't really need any kind of outside influence to say, oh yeah, I could do it like this. Yeah, no, I think it definitely helps you paint a picture in your mind, you know, just kind of going off of some things, um, whether it's reading or seeing a movie. But 
you know, for me, I, I kind of just, my imagination is just so wild. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm all over the place. Um, I think when I was in my high school English class, my teacher, Miss Krantz, like I got such, you know, my, I got like the highest composition paper of my class. And wow. she's like, you know, you got to do something with it. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to, you know. And then, you know, then it was like 16 years later, I wrote my first book, you know, and I was like, wow, she was right. You know, so I, a lot of it for me is just, you know, if you write a scene about maybe it's a bar or, or water or lake, you know, just put yourself in that surroundings, go to a bar, go to a stream mm -hmm. and do your writings or, or look around. That gives you inspiration. That's basically what I do, you know, and then, you know, a lot of people worry about like writer's block. Well, when you're writing something, put yourself into that place or go to a place, a similar place. It doesn't have to be where you're writing about, it, but it gives you inspiration or ideas or, you know, you touch, you hear things, you, you smell things, you see things. And that's where the, where my mind goes when I write, you yeah. got to put yourself in that element. Yeah. Well, so it's, I came out with one book. It's called uh, Confessions of a Frenetic Mind. And it's just five short stories. And my friend self-published it for me. But I did the same thing, too. When I, I was just like, I like, I love going, taking walks through the woods. And I would just do that, put on the headphones, listen to some music, and just sort of zone out. And I would just not think of anything. And then all these ideas would start. Same thing with comedy. When I was trying to think of new comedy, when I did stand comedy for a while, that would just, like, instead of, like, how can I think of new stuff? And I would just sort of, like, do what you said, go to a different place, a different atmosphere. And then all of a sudden, it's like, I think if sometimes when you try too hard, that's when they get people get writer's block. But if they just like open their mind and say, you know what, I'm not even going to think about it. That's when all the ideas come. That's how it works for me anyway. Yeah, you know, you're right. And sometimes the answers aren't directly in front of you. Like for me, it's just really being um, aware of your surroundings. Like one time yeah. I was in Middletown and I was at a red light, like heavy traffic on the weekend. I was just kind of looking around look at other cars you see people on their cell phones they're so yes. glued to the goddamn technology but i'm looking around and about four or five stories um up to my left in the apartment building i see a little boy waving to me <laughs> how many cars you think saw him i saw him i waved back he waved at me we made that connection but the point yeah. is is that if you're, if you're not just struck in this cell phone technology you're not looking around up left down right sometimes those answers are out there and you connect with these things that you know, it, it, the untrained eye doesn't see. You got to have that untrained eye. You got to know that, you know, there's a big world out there. Just start looking around. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Well, are you a Bruce Lee fan? I am, yeah. Right, yeah. So um, the reason I bring that up, because you brought up a point in the Enter the Dragon. I don't think it was the last time you saw it. I saw it recently. That's why I threat, when he's like pointing to the sky and the kids look at the finger, he slaps him in the face. He goes, don't look at the <laughs> finger. You're going to miss all this heavenly beauty. <laughs> yeah, he, exactly. He goes, open your mind. Just ex it's exactly what you said. And are, do you know who Henry Rollins is? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, so uh, I, I love seeing his spoken words, and they, he just travels. For people who don't know, he's a former punk singer for Black Flag. He's He writes books. He's been in plenty of movies, but now he does. He travels all over the world, and he comes back and just talks about it. And he said that one of the reasons he does, he just goes there and just – he doesn't put, like you said, puts all the technology away, and he says – I wonder what's going on in there. I wonder what's going on. And he, he notices all these things that all these other people are just walking by, living blindly with the blinders on. They have, they see it all the time and it doesn't even exist to them. And he notices so many more things and gets so much more information and meets so many, has so many different experiences than other people who are just, like you said, going through the motions, not even really living life. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, last time I talked to you, uh, as I mentioned, I said, uh, believe it or not, for people who don't live in Connecticut, if people do, you might not know about it. It's called Best Videos in Hamden. It's a great mm -hmm. place. And they have a Connecticut, local Connecticut filmmaker. And I was saying, you should put your movies there because your movies would do very well. And believe it or not, the place still does phenomenal business. They're coming out with a document. I drew, um, interviewed, I don't know if you ever heard of Gorman Bouchard. He's a documentarian, but he's doing a documentary on that. So I was talking about that. And the place has been around for, I mean, I... I, I went to go see a band there last week. I did comedy there several years ago. They have like thousands and thousands of movies of like, a, in the, you know, local filmmaker like you. They'll have French section, Russian section, documentaries, horror movies, drama. I mean, they, and if you can't find something, they will get it within two or three days. So I think I would love, if you want me to, if we ever get together sometime, I would gladly bring the movies down for you. I go there all the time. And yeah, you know, I've I've been there, but it's been um, a while, and I want to go back. And you know, when I used to go there, I, I actually because uh, I'm a big movie buff, and before I even got into the industry, and um, 
know, there's a lot of movies out there that, you know, you and I might like dabble, talk yeah. about. And if you Google it, you can't find it on stream. You can't even buy it Yeah. or find it on DVD. Like there's a film, I don't know if it's out yet. It's probably not, not even out yet. I want to say um, Selleck was in it. Maybe he wasn't, but um, it's called Folks. F-O-L. Oh. You, right? I McDonald's, right? The we stock don't... and the McDonald's and the, right? So, I mean, just like that was such a classic, but it's really hard to find. You can't find that on stream anywhere, um, that movie. It's from the... I want to say late eighties or maybe yeah. I think it's early nineties, something like that, but that's such a classic. Like, so there's all these iconic films, very underrated films that they're out there, but I bet you if I went down yep. to best video right now in Hamden, they probably would have it. I mean, they, they would. And if they don't have it, they will get it. Cause there's times where I've said, do you have this movie? And they're like, give me till Friday and I'll be a Wednesday. I'll get a text saying, Rich, it's in. But yeah, every, it's funny you mentioned that because every time I go to Cape Cod to visit my father, my father goes, Sonny boy. And that's from folks. And he, my yeah. father loves that movie. And he keeps on saying, he goes, Rich, if you ever find that oh. movie, please get it for me. So it's I've one been- of my uh, favorite underrated, like unknown. Cause like, you and I know what it is, but if like I went down the road and said, "Hey, you watch folks?" They're like, "What the heck are you talking about?" Like they don't know. No, you know? it's funny you said it because that every time I I usually go to Cape like around Christmas time, then one time in the summer, and every time, did you find folks yet? Did you find folks? He they <laughs> lo- yeah he still he still loves it. He quotes the movie like he just saw it yesterday. It, yeah, it's it's a great great film. Yeah, another one that uh, I I I was um reading about and i said i want to find it. i couldn't find it anywhere and they had it. it was did you ever see the movie barfly with mickey rourke it's about no i don't think i've seen that no it's about chuck uh bukowski i think his name is he's a, a poet but there's sort of a semi-autobiographical with mickey rourke and faye dunaway and i was i tried to stream it i tried finding it everywhere nowhere and then i went to best buy and i'm like oh yeah we have it right here so <laughs> so, so like i said i would love to i'm not sure i mean did you when you were down there before did you do you have your other movies over there um over over, over. A best video do you did you bring them down so they people can rent it no no i should i should get them on on um you know afford like a dvd and bring them I, that's definitely on my list you know uh because this is i think that's a good for the local community to have you know local yeah. film filmmakers films available there so i maybe i'll do like a whole batch of them just you know go down there and you know get get those in there and uh you know this is such good local talent that people don't know that's out there, you know, and, um, you know, this, this such good movies that, that are down there too. Like there's another film. I don't know if you saw, I want to say it's in the eighties, nineties called uh dead heat. You remember that oh, yeah. one where the animals oh. come to life and, you know, so th- that's another one. A lot of people don't know about, but, um, another good one, another good yeah. one. No, that, that's why it's so funny. It's like you and I have very similar thoughts on this because what I, most people will just watch, like the the popular ones, I'm, like examples, like I mentioned, Barbie or mm. Oppenheimer or Maestro, because oh well, I heard of that. I do the opposite. I look for movies that I never heard of this, but I want to check this out, and that's where that opens up so many other doors. To like, wow, who is this director? Like the perfect example, uh, Titani. Um, I could be pronouncing it wrong, but the girl gets pregnant by the car. And I said I gotta find out who this director is, and then I went to Best Video, and then they had her other movie there, which was just as good, and now I have her. I have it written down somewhere where when she comes out with a new movie, I want to check out and see when she's up to. So I'll, I'll see everything she does because I love the two releases she had so far. But yeah, I, I like seeing the movies that are less known and the directors that are on the Because I think like someone like you who's like still hungry, still loves it, still does it because he has a passion for it instead of just like, yeah, let me put out another movie. Let me and like these some of the they're basically just trying to they want money and you, yeah. you're doing it for the love of the movie and the love of the craft. And so some of these like big blockbusters, and then they're also because of they're owned by you know the studios will say, oh, you got to cut this, you got to do that. I love directors like you that can do anything you want because you have final say in everything, and you own your own studio, and you don't have to answer anybody. So those are the people I look for. Oh yeah, yeah, it makes things so much easier. You know, you get your your vision out there, and uh, nobody can tell you to you know take Back to the Future and change it to you know Spaceman from Pluto. You know, nobody's gonna tell me to do that. So. I love it. So you, you mentioned before that your movies, you enter them into festivals. What are some of the festivals mm-hmm. that you're going to be entering this uh, Article 92 in? Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of um, the local festivals, um, like the Boston International Film Festival, BIF, BIFF, I think is a big one. Yep. Uh, so some of the local ones and then some of the, the international ones. And, you know, there's even specialty 
film festivals that will like look specifically for sci-fi films. So I might dabble into some of those, um, you know, some of the New York markets, maybe some of the LA markets, some of the international markets and, um, you know, really some of the popular ones and then some of the specialized ones. Cause I think this definitely has, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of things for everyone. So I, I think we'll target just many different ones. You mentioned you won one award. How many awards have you won over the years? For have you won? Oh, any- it's yeah, it's up there. I mean, we've oh, had yeah. this film festival in Wisconsin recognize us well, for many years, MLC awards in, in Wisconsin. And tell you what, I've actually went there in person a couple times, and we won big over there. And I don't know if you've ever been to Wisconsin, but Green Bay, one of the cleanest cities I've ever been to in my life. And I'm talking about driving down the road, not a hint of garbage anywhere. I mean, it's just unbelievable over there. Um, and so we've traveled to, to, you know, Wisconsin, traveled to these different places to be acknowledged. And we've won, I think we've up for like, I don't know, like 15 nominations and, wow. you know, we're, we've won, I don't know, like handful of times, you know, eight, nine, maybe 10 times different, different awards, you know? Oh, congratulations. If I have, uh, I, I think I mentioned last time you were on the show, I think it was only on YouTube, but now it's on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon music, audible, iHeartRadio. radio. But my friend who puts it on YouTube, his name is John Bristol. He owns Elmwood Productions. And if he's watching right now while you're editing, I'm bringing this up for a reason because he and I were talking about this. He, For people who don't know, Elmwood Productions makes movies with puppets, but they're great. He makes horror movies, comedies, drama. It's, it's, they're great. But we were talking about getting a local film festival, putting it together and having all these local film artists like yourself and other people and just have like our own thing. And that's, I would love to have like if we get this off the ground, I would love to have you be a part of it. Well, yeah, that's a good thought. Actually, um, I didn't bring it up, but I actually am. A f- I actually have my own film festival, oh. believe it or not. Uh, I'm actually the founder of the Nutmeg Film Festival that recognizes wow. Connecticut films. Uh, we have the Nutmeg Film um, Award. It's a trophy we give out. We're in our second year right now on filmfreeway.com. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to be biased. So I'm, I obviously I don't enter my own films into the film festival, but we yeah. look for other people's work. So if you're a Connecticut filmmaker or, um, you know, various categories for shorts and features filmed in Connecticut, you know, we encourage you to submit uh, filmfreeway.com slash the Nutmeg Film Festival. We support the great state of Connecticut. So it's our second year. um, This is our second year now doing it uh, for this year. And when and where do you have that? Well, just because I'm a busy guy. I mean, I'd love to do it in person. We we, We dabbled about that in the beginning we were going to try to have it in person, but the dates didn't work out. And um, we had some, you know, other things going on with, um, you know, my father passing away. So I couldn't really make anything yeah. work with it. So we did like um, we uh, held it uh, virtually and we we judged the categories and we um, announced it virtually as far as the winners. And the one that did submit for the Nutmeg Trophy Award, we shipped them the trophy award. Um, and for apples, apples for butterflies, I think it was Abigail. She's a, uh, Connecticut native. And so at my film festival, you'll see the trophy with her, uh, winning that award. So this second year, we're also doing it virtually, but we may do like a, um, kind of like a pre, um, like a cocktail party. Like, you know, we might have like, uh, a venue that will show some of the nominees, like it closes, I believe we close this year in July or August. Okay. Um, so we might do a little quick icebreaker, but it'll probably be announced uh, virtually. When I have more free time, I want to dabble into like establishing, you know, uh, an appropriate venue to do it. But right now, I still want to recognize other talent out there. I just don't have the capacity to to, to work that out right now. I love that. All right. Well, before when uh, when uh, Mark Wither found out that I was doing this interview, he made a comment saying, Rich, really dig deep on this one. I said, oh, what, my two and a half to three hour interviews aren't deep enough for you? He goes, dig <laughs> deep. So question for you, before we go, is there anything that you want to talk about that I missed, that I didn't go over, that I didn't cover, that you didn't talk about? This is for yeah. Mark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, he's always got, um, you know, those those uh, those questions. And um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I think we covered a lot. I mean, we've been talking, I think, for over two hours, I yeah. think. Um, we talked we talked shop we talked movies we talked about other things as well yeah. um and i'm just trying to figure out about anything we forgot and uh I wouldn't want to disappoint mark with it yeah i mean um <laughs> he is a ninja for for a reason i don't know if you know that but i call him the, the ninja because he uh i i kind of put him in um 
certain shots where we call it the ninja shot. Like when we were filming at uh, the auto body shop in Waterbury, um, I wanted to like, so for this film, I had a couple drone shots. I didn't have my drone guy with me for this shot. I wanted to get kind of like an aerial shot. I, so I'm looking around, I'm like, Mark, there's a garbage truck over there. I want you to climb up on top of it. <laughs> and so he climbs up on top of it. And then he's like, yeah, I can get the shot. So we call it the ninja, n the ninja shot. So, I love it. <laughs> uh, so yeah. And then, you know, there's another shot. We were like blocking out in Watertown when the cops were blocked, I was filming straight on. I'm looking around. I'm like, Ninja, where are you? He's like ducked down behind the car, like a low shot. I'm like, Oh, there you are. You know? So you never know him. He's always, you know, around somewhere. How long, how long have you been working with him? Yeah, it seems longer, but I've I've known uh, Mark since 2019. Okay, we've been doing stuff. So I mean, you know, several years still, as well. But uh, it seems you know it seems longer though. Definitely. How, seems how did he become involved? Did he start off auditioning for one of your movies? Yeah, that's right. Where I met him in Wallingford, we were doing a film down there, and I was looking for background extras, and he was uh, um, an extra in this club club dance. Tommy Ferry was there. And basically, Tommy just <laughs> took a machine gun out and just killed everyone. So Mark was uh, one of the guys who got killed. And we were just talking after. He's like, you know, I want to get more involved. And, you know, I like what you're doing. And we kind of talked further. And I brought him on. And and now he's kind of been my my right-hand uh, man ever the ninja. since. The ninja, yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, Mark, I hope you're satisfied with this interview because <laughs> I think we pretty much covered everything. We went from movies to UFOs to conspiracy theories to uh, directors to writers that's actors. right so i think i think we've been basically covered it all i definitely can't wait to see your next musical that i'm really looking forward to that that's right actually yeah you you'd be surprised i'm actually uh toying with an idea i don't want to spoil it but yeah i already have a title i already have a script in my head about what i'm going to do with it like it's all up here already well you know what that means you're going to have to come back in the claws corner and talk all about it i can't wait that's right <laughs> and check out repo <laughs> the genetic opera yeah I'm going to check that out. Paul Sorvino, Bill Mosley, and it's been so long, but I know there's other people that you would definitely know that are in that genre that say, oh, he's in it. And it's they sing and they're talented. It's funny. It's it's, it's a really good movie. So before cool, yeah. we go, uh, we already will say what's next. Where can people find you? What else do you want to plug? Yeah, so I mean, like I said, Article 92, we're wrapping. We got like uh, three more days of filming in April. Then we'll be officially in uh, uh, post-production. That means we're editing, we're adding music, we're getting the right tone of it, uh, putting it all together. Um, so that's our main focus. Uh, more info about that film is at uh, www.thehawkstudios.com. Mm -hmm. Go on there. You could, you could Right on the homepage, you'll see Article 92. Click read more. It tells you there's photos, more about the film. And that's basically our focus is Article 92 coming hot and heavy right now. Filmed Connecticut, Mass, Rhode Island and United Kingdom. So uh, watch out there. We're not alone. The truth is out there. And we are not alone. <laughs> that's right. Joe, it's always great to have you on the show. I love having you be a friend of the Claws Corner. And once again, you are welcome back anytime. Even if you have nothing Absolutely. to promote, just come back. We'll talk about movies and everything else. There's always something to talk about. You know it. You know it. All right. Article 92 <laughs> is the movie. I will definitely keep you updated when it's going to be released. And this time I will be at the premiere. I can't wait. That sounds good, man. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. That wraps up the latest episode of The Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to the extremely talented actor, writer, producer, director, editor, sound engineer, location scout, everything. Joe McGee <laughs> for taking time out of his extremely busy schedule to be a guest on my show. Thank you very much. A huge thanks also goes out to editor extraordinaire John Bristol, the award-winning Elmer Productions, for always doing a superb job editing the show each and every week and making it available to all on YouTube. I also need to thank Joseph Timothy Quirk and Rob Bull for all they do to make my show available on several Connecticut radio stations as well as Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. And lastly, but definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone.
all of a sudden I hear bim, bim. <laughs> What's a diaphragm again? <laughs> We caught one. They're supposed to be weird. Oh, yeah, no. If you say so. I've always wanted to be in a movie. Waiting around for autumn. Waiting around for autumn. I want